The first prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I want to bring up is Daniel chapter 2. Now in this chapter, the king of Babylon, he sees a vision of a rock smashing an idol. And Daniel, he interprets this vision as meaning there will be five successive kingdoms coming in order and ruling. The first of these kingdoms is the Babylonian Empire, and the final one is God's kingdom. Verses 39 to 40, after you, the Babylonian kingdom, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Verse 44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Slide. So here we have from Babylon, starting from Babylon, five successive kingdoms coming in order and ruling. And if we look in history, the kingdoms to successively arise after Babylon in order were Persia, Greece, Rome, and finally the Islamic Empire. And all of these correspond to the kingdoms mentioned in verses 39 to 44. But Daniel makes it clear that these are successive empires, and Jews and Christians agree by consensus that the kingdoms after Babylon were Persia, Greece, and Rome. So the only question to ask is, historically, which kingdom came after the Roman Empire? And that was the Islamic Empire. Now, if the Islamic Empire is not the kingdom of God, Daniel 2 becomes a false prophecy. How do we know? Because Daniel 2 is talking about kingdoms coming one after another, in order and ruling. Historically, one cannot deny that the Islamic Empire came after the Roman Empire. So if the Islamic Empire is not the kingdom of God, Daniel 2 becomes a false prophecy. Again, this is because Daniel is speaking about com kingdoms coming in order and ruling. This is what the Benson Commentary says. In the days of these kings, that is kingdoms, or during the succession of these four monarchies, and it must be during the time of the last of them, because they are reckoned four in succession, and consequently, this must be the fifth kingdom. This is what Rashi says. In the days of these kings, when the kingdom of Rome is still in, still in existence, when the kingdom of Rome is still in existence, slide. Now, in verse 41, Daniel says that Rome will eventually become a divided kingdom. And this refers to the fact that the Roman Empire eventually became divided into two sub-empires. And this happened in the year 395 CE. So the kingdom of God has to arise after the year 395 CE, when the Roman Empire was permanently divided. Again, Daniel says the kingdom of God will occur, it will come after Rome is divided. Rome was divided in 395 CE, so God's kingdom has to happen, it has to occur after 395 CE. Now this doesn't match Jesus who came before 395 CE. In verse 44, it says the kingdom of God must arise, quote, during the, times of the, during the time of these kings, meaning when the kingdom of Rome is still in existence. Now, when was the Roman Empire destroyed? That happened in the year 1453 CE, when the Muslims ended the Roman Empire. And Daniel says the kingdom of God has to arise while the Roman Empire still exists. So the last point, the latest point the kingdom of God could arise is the year 1453 CE. So in summary, we get this chart that I've laid out here, this timeline. The kingdom of God has to arise between 395 CE and 1453 CE. And look at that, the Islamic Empire arose in 622 CE within this timeline. Jesus, on the other hand, his first coming was before this period, and his second coming will be after this period. So Jesus does not fill, he does not fulfill this timeline. Now, can the Islamic Empire be described as God's kingdom? Of course. Well, all four, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, these were pagan empires. The Islamic Empire is a monotheistic empire set up by God's own prophet and his companions, and it ruled by God's law. And when it came, at an unprecedented speed, it conquered lands from China to France. Finally, Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 confirmed that the kingdom of God will destroy the Roman Empire. Who destroyed the Roman Empire? Again, that was the Islamic Empire that destroyed the Roman Empire in the year 1453 CE. Slide. Now this brings me to my next prophecy, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child is born for us, a son is given for us, and authority is upon his shoulder. Slide. What does this phrase mean? Countless commentaries mention that the meaning of authority is upon his shoulder is that this child will have some sort of a symbol of authority upon his shoulder. Scholars like Adam Clark mention in their commentaries that in ancient times, kings, commanders, generals, etc., they place some sort of a symbol of authority like a key, a scepter, or a sword upon their shoulder. And so we know from these commentaries and the historical context that this child also will have some sort of a symbol of authority upon a shoulder. In Isaiah 22, a key is placed on Eliakim's shoulder to symbolize his authority. Slide. This is what Joseph Blankensop says, a, a very highly respected scholar, academic scholar. He translates it as the emblems of sovereignty rest on his shoulders. And he writes, an attempt to render Mishra, which occurs only here, and may point to investiture with a robe or other symbol of authority. Slide. 
Now, the Islamic sources confirm that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a symbol of authority known as the seal of Prophethood upon his left shoulder. Abdullah bin Sar just reports seeing it on his left shoulder, slide, and Jabir bin Samura reports seeing it on his shoulder as well, slide. Now, the question is, what will the child in Isaiah 9 do? Verse 4 tells us, For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burns them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Now the question is, did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his coming fulfill this? Meaning, did his coming lead to the defeat of the foreign oppressors of Israel? The answer is yes. Beginning with the Jewish-Roman wars, the Romans had oppressed the Israelites, and in fact they oppressed them before as well. The Romans then destroyed the temple, exiled the Jews, and placed a pagan temple on Mount Zion. When Rome became Christian, it persecuted the Israelites further, and even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Roman Christians had banned the Jews from entering Jerusalem, and they had filled the holy sites on Mount Zion with trash, filth, and even menstrual blood. When did this all change? It changed with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His companions went out as an army under the leadership of Umar radiallahu an, the second caliph of Islam, and the companion of the Prophet, and this army conquered Jerusalem. Muslims conquered Palestine as a whole, taking it from the oppressive Roman Christians who had been oppressing the Israelites for 500 years. They had banned them. And when the Muslims took over, again the Israelites came back into Jerusalem and the holy sites on Mount Zion were cleansed. So Isaiah 9 expands on Daniel 2 by telling us that God's kingdom will be the result of a child who has a symbol of authority upon his shoulder. Slide. And this then brings me to my next prophecy, which is Psalm 74. Now this is a prayer for God to end the Roman oppression that the Israelites will be in. I've already demonstrated that the Roman oppression on the Israelites was ended by the Muslims. So this psalm is really praying to God to save, save the Israelites from the Romans by sending the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his companions. Now since this psalm is a prayer for deliverance, the implication is that when the Israelites saw that the descriptions of the psalm are beginning to be fulfilled, they would know that God's deliverance through the Prophet Muhammad is near. So in other words, the descriptions of this psalm are signs that indicate when, at what time, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him will arise. First one indicates that this psalm is describing a historical situation when the Israelites will have been in a punishment period for a very, very long time. Oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smolder against the sheep of your pasture? This means that a sign of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that the Israelites would have been in a punishment period for a very, very long time. And this perfectly fits when he came. When he came, the Israelites had been exiled for 500 years. Verse 7 tells us that God's enemies have destroyed the temple. Quote, they burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. When did this happen? That happened in the year 70 CE when the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. So when the Israelites saw that the temple has been destroyed by the Romans, that would be a sign to them that the coming of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the deliverance is near. Now verse 9 tells us that at this time in history, prophets are not left, there are no prophets left, and no one knows how long this punishment period will last. Quote, We are given no signs from God, no prophets are left, and none of us knows how long this will last. The question is, when did such a historical situation arise? The answer is, it's describing the Roman exile. It's only in this exilic period that there were no prophets. In the Babylonian exile, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel were all active. So Psalm 74 cannot be describing the Babylonian exile. Also, this psalm says no one knows how long this will last. No one knows how long the punishment will last. Again, this fits the Roman period, the Roman exile period, but it does not fit the Babylonian exile because Jeremiah 29 explicitly prophesied and told the Israelites, don't worry, this Babylonian exile, it's only going to last 70 years. But this punishment period, they don't know how long this will last. And that matches the Roman exile. Now, in the psalm, the author repeatedly prays for God to end the punishment period. Verse 11, why do you hold back your hand, your right hand, take it from the folds of your garment and destroy them? Now, again, I've already demonstrated that the Muslims ended the punishment period of the Romans by conquering Palestine from the Romans, allowing the Israelites back, and cleansing the holy sites on Mount Zion, and bringing God's rule back to Palestine. So this psalm was fulfilled through the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In short, this psalm informs the Israelites of certain signs to look out for that would indicate when, at what time, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would arise. These signs include the burning of the temple, a very, very long punishment period under foreign rule, and the fact that God would stop sending prophets. When these conditions would be fulfilled, God's deliverance would arise. And this perfectly matches history when the Romans destroyed the temple and exiled the Jews for 500 years, and prophets stopped arising until God's deliverance came through the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the coming of whom ended the Roman exile and allowed the Israelites back into Jerusalem. Slide.
Now, another prophecy which informs the Israelites of certain signs that would occur before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is Isaiah 24. Now, this prophecy, it begins by speaking about the punishment on Jerusalem and the Jews being exiled by the Romans. And this prophecy, it then ends by speaking about the conquest of Jerusalem, talking about how God is now once again railing, reigning in Jerusalem. God has once again conquered Jerusalem. So God's people will conquer Jerusalem and the Muslims conquer Jerusalem in the year 638 CE. Now what will happen between the conquest of Jerusalem and the uh, destruction of Jerusalem? Certain events will occur. So because these events occur uh, just before the conquest of Jerusalem, Isaiah is telling us that certain signs will occur before the conquest of Jerusalem happens. What are these signs? The first of these signs it's mentioned in verses 14 to 16, and here we see that before the conquest of Jerusalem, Christianity will spread to the Gentiles. Christianity will spread to the Gentiles. This is clear from verses 14 to 16 because in these verses we see the Gentiles around the world are beginning to worship the God, the one God, and yet Isaiah condemns their worship and he says this worship is false. He says, but I said, I waste away, I waste away, woe to me, the treacherous betray, with treachery the treacherous betray, terror and pit and snare await you, slide. Now here you can see Joseph Blankensop and slide, here you can see the Oxford Bible Commentary. And they both confirm that Isaiah is condemning these Gentiles. So it looks like the Gentiles are worshipping God, but Isaiah condemns them. And that describes Christianity. It looked like people are beginning to worship the God of the Old Testament, but actually their worship was false. They turned a human being into God and they worshiped the Trinity. So Isaiah destroys them, he refutes them. Now when did Christianity spread to the Gentiles? That happened at the end of the 4th century, which is when... Uh, in the year 380 CE, around there, Rome, uh, Rome declared Christianity as its official religion. So around the end of the 4th century is when Christianity really spread to the Gentiles. After this, we're told by Isaiah that many natural disasters will occur. Slide. So basically, Isaiah goes on to describe natural disasters happening. Now, interestingly, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, arose in the year 570 CE, and just before his coming, there were a series of natural disasters. The year 536 CE has often been called the worst year in history because of the amount of natural disasters that happened then. These, naturals, uh, these natural disasters include the sun's light becoming dim for like a year and a half, volcanic eruptions, uh, one happened in the year 551 CE, and also around this time there was the Justinian Plague. Again, after all this, the Prophet Muhammad would arise and he arose in the year 570 CE. After all this, Isaiah tells us that God will punish the kings of the earth and he will begin to reign in Jerusalem. And this was fulfilled by the Muslims. When they went out as an empire, they conquered many lands and defeated their kings and they conquered Jerusalem, bringing God's rule back to Jerusalem. And so they brought God's rule back to Jerusalem after over a thousand years of pagan rule. So in short, Isaiah 24 mentions that certain events will occur in order. There'll be a Jewish exile. Unitarian Christianity will spread. There'll be natural disasters. And then finally, there'll be the conquest of Jerusalem and the punishment on the kings. And all this perfectly matches Islamic history and history up to the year 638 CE when... The Muslims conquered Jerusalem. Slide. Another prophecy I want to speak about is Isaiah 42, and I'll quote some sections from it now. Here is my slave whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will place my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out. And this verse is speaking about him not shouting out of grief, and it indicates the servant will rely on God. He will not raise his voice in the streets. The islands will await his law. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sin in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Now throughout Isaiah 2, we're told the servant will convert the Gentiles to monotheism. The Catarites are specifically mentioned in verse 11. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voices. The settlements where Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Salah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. And the Kedarites are Arab Ishmaelites, as Genesis 25 and Ezekiel 27 confirm. And Salah, interestingly, is a mountain in Medina. Verse 17, But those who trust in idols, who say to images, You are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. 
Question is, how did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fulfill Isaiah 42? Well, he was God's slave who brought the law of God to the nations. Even the rabbis of Medina described him as not raising his voice in the marketplace, as verse 2 says. And one of his names is Al-Mutawakkil, the one who relies on God. He was a covenant to the Israelites, as Surah 2, Ayah 100 confirms. And he was a light to the Gentiles. It is he who brought monotheism to the Gentiles, opening their eyes from the darknesses of paganism into monotheism. He also converted the Arabs, as verse 11 says, and he made them rejoice. He also came to Medina, where Mount Salah is. Further, he destroyed the idols of the Arabs, and his followers destroyed other idols in the lands that they conquered, and turning back the idolaters in utter shame. Finally, the phrase, to free captives from prison, in verse 7, refers to bringing Jewish exiles back into Jerusalem, and once again, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came, after his coming, his followers uh, conquered Jerusalem, and the Israelites came back into Jerusalem. Slide. Now, towards the end of First Isaiah, we encounter certain prophecies that have a lot of parallel language to Isaiah 42. So we know they're speaking about the same events as Isaiah 42. One of these texts is Isaiah 29, verses 17 to 24. A very interesting verse here is verse 18. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. And this was fulfilled in the Quran. Surah 14, Ayah 1, Alif, Lam, Ra, a book which we have sent down to you that you might bring mankind out of darknesses into the light by the permission of their Lord to the path of the exalted and might the praiseworthy. Indeed, the Quran brought the world from paganism into monotheism. So Isaiah says that when Isaiah 42 is fulfilled, a scripture from God will come and it's described and the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought a book from God. Slide. Another feature of these texts that talk about the same time as Isaiah 42 is that at this time, a desert will rejoice. For example, Isaiah 35 verse 1, The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. The coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made the Arabian desert rejoice. Now, remember in Isaiah 42, there's this verse saying that the desert of Kedar will rejoice. And Kedar is Ishmael, he's the son of Ishmael. So here, that verse is given its own chapter. It, that is the highlight of this chapter because that's how this chapter begins. So we know we have to pay special attention to the verse in Isaiah 42 that says the desert of the Ishmaelites will rejoice. Isaiah 35 also confirms that at this point, Jewish exiles will be allowed back into Jerusalem. Verse 10, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and enter Zion with joyful shouting. Now once again, when the Muslims came, they allowed the Jewish exiles back into the land after the Romans had banned them for 500 years. Slide. So far, we've seen that in Isaiah 42, the Qur'an is described as God's law. And in Isaiah 29, the Qur'an is described as a book from God. Another description of the Qur'an is in Isaiah 28, verse 11. Very well then, with mocking lips in a foreign language, God will speak to this people. Verse 13. So then the word of the Lord will become to them, sav, let sav, sav, let sav, qav, let qav, qav, let qav, a little here, a little there. Now, the Qur'an fulfills this description because it came in the foreign language of Arabic. And it includes a lot of sarcasm slash mockery. So again, Isaiah says it will come in a foreign language and it'll come with mocking lips. The Qur'an is in the foreign language of Arabic and it includes a lot of mockery. Isaiah also says the word of God will come a little here, a little there. And that matches the fact that the Qur'an was not revealed all at once. The Qur'an was actually revealed gradually, slowly, little by little over the course of 23 years. Isaiah also says the word of God will become like sav, let sav, sav, let sav, qav, let qav, qav, let qav. Slide. What does this mean? Well, scholars like Otto Kaiser, slide, and scholars like William Halo, they explain that what's going on here is that Isaiah is saying that the word of God will become like a school teacher teaching the letters of the alphabet. And they argue that the school teacher has just gotten to the letters sadi and qaf. So the word of God will become like a school teacher teaching the letters of the alphabet, including the letters Sadi and Qaf. Now, interestingly, the Quran often begins its chapters with letters of the alphabet, such as the beginning of Surah 2, slide, Alif, Lam, Mim, or the beginning of Surah 20, Laha. These are letters of the Arabic alphabet. They're not words. Now, Isaiah mentioned specifically the letters Sadi and Qaf, so we should give them special attention. Interestingly, Surah 38 begins with Sa'd, which is the Arabic equivalent of the Hebrew letter Sa'de. And Surah 50 begins with Qaf, which is the Arabic equivalent of the Hebrew Qaf. And you can see that when I demonstrate how we pronounce these letters at the beginning of Surahs, they sound like a teacher teaching the letters of the alphabet. Right? For example, Ain Sin Qaf. So in short, 
Isaiah foretold that the word of God will come in a foreign language, little by little, and will come in the form of the letters of the alphabet. The Quran often begins its chapters not with words, but with letters from the alphabet. It is in the foreign language of Arabic, and it was revealed slowly, little by little, over 23 years. Slide. Now, the final prophecy I want to touch on is the parable of the wedding banquet in Matthew 22. In this prophecy, Jesus describes the fact that God sent many servants to the Israelites, many prophets and servants, come to God, come to God, inviting the Israelites to God's paradise, but the Israelites kept rejecting them and killing many of them. In verse 7, God retaliates. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And the king here represents God, and the events alluded to are the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Romans in the year 70 CE. This was God's punishment upon the Israelites. What will happen after the destruction of the temple? Verses 8 to 10. The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered, gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. This was referring to God sending out more servants of his to now invite the Gentiles to his paradise. And this was fulfilled with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions who went out to the Gentiles, invited them to Islam, and the Gentiles accepted. Now note that the reference by Jesus is not to Paul's ministry. Jesus says first the temple will be destroyed, the city Jerusalem will be destroyed, and then the mission to the Gentiles will begin. Paul died before the destruction of the temple. And Acts, all of the book of Acts is set before the destruction of the temple. So Paul began his ministry to the Gentiles before the destruction of the temple. Jesus says it will happen after the destruction to, uh, of the temple. And the prophet Muhammad began his ministry to the Gentiles after the destruction of the temple. And the fact that uh, Matthew 22 is speaking about going out to the Gentiles is confirmed by Davies and Allison, uh, who mentioned that in the International Critical Commentary slide. So to summarize my opening statement, we see that certain signs would precede the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They would occur before his coming. These signs include the rise of the Roman Empire, the burning of the temple, the exile of the Jews, the fact that God would stop sending prophets, the fact that Trinitarian Christianity would spread to the Gentiles, and that happened around the year 380 CE. The fact that the Roman Empire would be divided, and that happened in the year 395 CE. We're also told that the punishment of the Israelites would last so long that they would feel as if they'd been in punishment forever. Uh, and that matches around the time when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came, when the Israelites were in punishment for 500 years. And also, we're told, before his coming, natural disasters will, will occur. Finally, uh, and once again, all these signs occurred just before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he comes at the right time. Slide. Furthermore, the prophecies describe him in the following way. He would have a symbol of authority upon his shoulder. He would set up the kingdom of God. And this kingdom, it had to arise. This kingdom of God had to arise between 395 and 1453 CE. Number three, his nation would defeat the kings of the earth, including the Roman Empire. Number four, his followers would conquer Jerusalem. Number five, he would rely on God. Number six, he would convert the Gentiles, including the Arabs, to monotheism. Number seven, him and his nation would destroy idols. Number eight, he would bring a new law from God. Number nine, he would bring a book from God. Number ten, his book would be in a foreign language, include letters of the alphabet, and be revealed little by little. Number eleven, his coming would end a Jewish exile and allow the Israelites back into Jerusalem. And number twelve, he would make the desert rejoice. Again, all this was fulfilled with the coming of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Slide. Now at this point, I just want you to compare the very, very clear texts and prophecies I brought with the prophecies that Joshua accepts for Jesus. These are prophecies in the New Testament, which Matthew says Jesus fulfilled. One of these prophecies that Matthew quotes is in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, where he says that there's a prophecy in the Old Testament about Jesus, and it says that the Messiah, quote, will be called a Nazarene. The problem is, Matthew made up this prophecy. Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. Matthew made it up. And guess what? Joshua thinks this is a great fulfillment of prophecy for Jesus because Matthew says it and uh, Joshua believes in the Gospel of Matthew. Another example of a fake prophecy in the New Testament is Matthew chapter 2 verses 14 to 15 in which Matthew quotes Hosea 11, Out of Egypt I called my son. And he applies this to Jesus coming out of Egypt as a child. The problem is, Matthew chopped off the first half of the sentence. And when one returns to Hosea 11, we see that it actually says, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. 
Hey, this is talking about Israel, and it's talking about the Exodus, a past event. What does Matthew do? He chops off the sentence, and he lies, and he says, uh, a text that's talking about the past is actually a prophecy of Jesus. And these are the types of prophecies the New Testament presents for Jesus. So you saw in the beginning, Joshua was saying, he's going to show how Muslims, we believe in Isa Jesus, we don't look at the context, etc. Look at this, Matthew is making up prophecies, and he's chopping off context, etc. And, and this is what you believe. I, on the other hand, only brought responsible exegesis and very, very difficult criteria to fulfill with the Prophet Muhammad did, and that's my time. All right, all right, all right. That's first round. That was the opening statement. Appreciate that, Brother Ibrahim. Brother Josh, it'll be on you. When you start talking, your time will start. Well, I need um Trilla to pull up my slide first. All right, Brother Trilla, you there? You got that information up? Yeah, is this the right thing right here? Yeah, scroll it up to the top, please. Scroll it up to the top. Go to the top page. Scroll it up. There we go. Okay, you can um start the timer now. Is it started? Let me know. Am I on the clock? Ain't nobody saying nothing. Dre, start, really? Yeah, yeah. I just, I'm about. To, I'm starting now. As soon as you start talking, yep, I started. Thank you. Well, Wait, appreciate Josh, let this. Me just mute. Sorry. I just forgot to mute. You have to mute yourself. Okay, start over there. Start time over. I'm good. Good to go. Talk to me, y'all. Okay, here we go. That was a spirited presentation, brother Ebra Rahim. But unfortunately, it was absolute trash. And that's not an insult. I'm just going to show you from the information provided. First of all, before I go on to the bunk. All these scriptures that you rip out of context, I'm going to show everybody what Muslims do. I put together a little presentation for you. This is titled, The Top Three Ways Muslims Twist Biblical Passages. Once I show you all these techniques, every time a Muslim tries any of these things, you will see this from now on. And he did all three of them. First of all, we're going to go to contextualize. Contextualize means to consider something or to help other people consider something in its context, the situation within which it exists or happens, which can help explain it. And this is the reference dictionary.cambridge.org if you want to look up the definition of contextualize. In other words, context is crucial because it provides the required information to fully comprehend a situation, ideal, or message. Muslims who attempt to insert Muhammad into biblical passages completely disregard context. And a, I'm going to show y'all this exactly what this brother did for every verse that he went to. Number two, they use false slash pseudo etymology. False slash pseudo etymology is an explanation of the origins of a word which does not correspond to its actual history. In contrast to scholarly etymology, False etymology is based not on the laws of language development, but on a fortuitous similarity between words. In other words, you take two words that sound the same and you try to make them mean the same. This is the reference right there, encyclopedia2.freedictionary.com, right? Then it says, this is most evident when Muslims try to link the Greek word paracletos or paraclete to the name Ahmad, i.e. Muhammad, which I'm pretty sure my opponent is going to try to attempt tonight. And of course, the third reason is they poison the well. And yes, he did that too. Poisoning the well is to commit a preemptive ad hominem abusive attack against an opponent, in this case, the Bible. And he did that when he went to the end in Matthew. He tried to discredit Matthew and make y'all think Matthew was making up prophecies. He's poisoning the well. He's already trying to discredit the Gospels before I even go there. These are the methods that um, Muslims use. And you can find this um, definition at logicalfallacies.com, right? That is to prime the audience adverse information about the opponent, in this case being the Bible and myself, because he mentioned me, from the start in an attempt to make your claim more acceptable or discount the credibility. And you don't have to slide down after this by the way, because I'm going to start responding to what he did, right? I want you to close the side, slide, excuse me. I want you to close the um, slide after this because I'm not going to deal with that yet, right? It says more acceptable or discount the credibility of your opponent's claim. Muslims typically poison the well when they preemptively claim the Bible has been corrupted 
and therefore cannot be trusted or at least not completely. This is exactly what my opponent did when he went to Matthew. He had to poison the well first, had to make y'all doubt the validity of Matthew. This is all three approaches that Muslims do every time they read the Bible. Now it's cleanup time. Let's go to Daniel's chapter two because he tried to make that bill about Muhammad. That was just pathetic. This is Daniel two and 44. He mentioned correctly that there are four successive empires, the Babylonian empire, the Medo-Persian empire, the Greek empire, and the Roman empire. But Daniel only mentions four empires. He gave you five. That's what he did. He told you after Rome, that was Islam. That's what he said. But look what it says right here. Daniel 2 and 44. And we're going to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Look what it says. And in the days of these kings, during this empire, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which he says is the Islamic kingdom. That's what he said. Which shall never be destroyed. So this man is telling y'all that the Islamic kingdom as set up now will never be destroyed. That's his prediction. Then it says, we shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. This is describing a messianic eternal kingdom. This is not describing an earthly kingdom. The Islamic empire is an earthly kingdom. And I'm going to let the Bible tell you that in the book of Daniel. Notice he jumped from the book of Daniel, but he don't let the book of Daniel explain the book of Daniel. Now let's go over to Daniel chapter seven. This is sad, y'all. This is sad. That's why I said they ignore context. We're going to see the same thing and look what it pertains to. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Look what it says. After this, I saw in the night vision and behold a fourth beast. That's that Roman Empire that he was talking about. The fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamp the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that before it, the first three beasts before it. Look what it says. And it had 10 horns. But let's get to the, the fruit of this. Look what it says who this kingdom belongs to. We're going to skip down to verses 13 and 14. Look what it says. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven. That ain't talking about no Muhammad, bro. That's talking about Jesus, because all you Muslims do is try to take prophecies applying to Jesus and try to throw them on Muhammad. This is not talking about your Muhammad. This is talking about our Jesus Christ. Look what else it says. They came to the ancient of days. That's the father, God. And they brought him near before him. But watch how this says the same thing that Daniel 2 and 44 said about the kingdom. Look what it says. And there was given him the one like unto the son of man. That's Jesus Christ. And that was given him, not Muhammad, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Not the Islamic empire, not Muhammad, not Muslims. It said that all them shall serve him. Look what else it said. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's exactly what we read in Daniel 2 and 44. He's talking about them same four empires, not the fourth one, and then the Islamic empire after that. You have to completely read this context because you ignore context when you first read it. There was a trash interpretation of that. But now let's go even further. Now let's link it up with the New Testament. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. This is after Jesus died, resurrected, before he ascended to heaven. Watch what the apostles asked him. This is Acts chapter 1. I'm going to try to get to as many of them he went to as possible because I can't respond to all of them. I just don't have enough time. Acts chapter 1, 4 to 6. Look what it says. And being assembled together with them, talking about Jesus and his disciples, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he. And the promise is the Holy Spirit, by the way, the comforter, not Muhammad, because I know that's coming and I'm already ready for it. Right. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost many days hence. Right. I'm sorry. I'm verse three. Let me see why I stopped there. I kind of got off a little bit. Here we go right here. Yes. It says, verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Look what they ask him in verse 6. When they therefore were come together, the apostles, not Muhammad, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? No, they didn't ask him, are you going to give the empire over to the, to the Muslims? 
or to the Islamists, they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they understood the prophecy and what Jesus had been teaching. And the prophecy was that Israel would be the ones ruling in the everlasting kingdom and the Christians, not Muslims. That's why they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, Jesus came to restore. Even the Quran tells you that. This is what this says right here. But let's go on a little bit more. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Because I noticed that he was saying, slide. I like that. That was cool. I was like saying slide. I, I like that. Right. But let me show y'all that he tried to slide here. That was an appropriate word because he tried to slide something by y'all here. When he went to Isaiah chapter nine, six and seven. That's what he tried to do. And he tried to and he's trying to accuse Matthew of being deceitful. Let me show you what you did. This is Isaiah chapter nine, six and seven. Look for, for this. He said this is about Muhammad. Everybody heard him say it. This is about Muhammad. Watch this. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Slide. That's what he did. When he got to this part, he said slide. Now, he got a Bible right in front of him, so y'all know he read the rest of this, but he intentionally left it out. Why? Because it's proved that Jesus is God, and Muslims can't stand that. Watch what it says right here. And his name, this child born, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The everlasting father, the prince of peace. This is the reason why he said slide. We tried to slide that by y'all. So now he's going to have to say he don't like this anymore. He took a piece of that. He took a piece of that and tried to be slick. You're not slick, Ibrahim. And we know that Muhammad was never called Allah. So you can't say this is talking about Muhammad. What prophetic figure in history was considered both God and man? Jesus Christ. And if you try to make this Muhammad, then you're saying that Muhammad was prophesied to be called God, which he was never called in the Quran. And you know that. Well, let's move on. Let's see where else he tried to go. Let's go to Psalm 74, because he butchered this team. He tried to make this to be about the, the um, um, 70 AD. This is Psalm 74, verse 1. Look what it says. Oh God, why hast thou cast us out forever? Why does thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pastor? This is the son, this is the psalm of the, the masculine of Asaph, right? Look what else it says. We're going to skip down and read verse 7. They have cast fires into thy sanctuary and have defiled by casting down thy dwelling place of thy name to the ground. I'm going to show you that this is talking about 586 B.C. when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. This is not talking about 70 A.D. I'm going to say that to you. Because then you go to verse 9 and you try to point this out. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet. Neither is there among us any that know of how long. You said, yo. This is proof that it's got to be Muhammad because there were prophets during the time of the Babylonian captivity. Yes, there were. You had Jeremiah, you had Isaiah, you had Ezekiel, and you had Daniel. But what you're not taking into context is that this is talking about there would be no more prophets in Jerusalem. And I'm going to prove that to you right now. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 3. It's not talking about no prophets, period. It meant prophets in Jerusalem. That's why you got to rightly divide the word of truth. This is Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Look what it says. For behold, and this is about the judgment of the Lord that he's going to bring upon Israel. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, does take away from Jerusalem and Judah. What is he going to take away from them? The stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. What is he taking away from them? Watch what it says. The mighty man will no more be in Jerusalem and the man of war no more in Jerusalem. 586, Babylonian captivity. What else? And the prophet. So when you read Psalm 74, they were saying there's not going to be a prophet no more in Jerusalem. Not no more period during the Babylonian captivity. This is the prophecy telling you what's going on. This is what else it says, right? It says, and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient. That's what this is talking about. You have butchered, once again, Isaiah chapter 3, just like you butchered um, Psalm 74, just like you butchered Daniel chapter 2. But we're not done yet. Let me show you another prophecy of this, because they all knew this. We're going to go to Amos chapter 8. He's trying to come in and run this Islamic um, game on us. All the prophets knew that this was going to happen. This is Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Look what he said was going to happen. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. When he was talking about the kingdom of Israel, right? Look what he told them. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. 
What kind of famine? Not the famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing the words of the Lord. The words of the Lord from who? From the prophets. But notice he said the famine was going to be in the land, meaning the land of Israel. Not no prophets in general during the Babylonian captivity, no prophets in Israel. You have completely obliterated the context. That's why I said y'all ignore context. Y'all don't care about context when it comes to this Bible. But now let's go to Isaiah 24 and 1 because he butchered that too. He took all these verses out of context. And that's all he's going to do all night. He's going to do one of those top three. He's going to ignore context. He's going to refer to pseudo etymology or he's going to poison the well. That's all Muslims do. They're going to do that all night long. And you're going to see it coming. In fact, I challenge everybody in the chat, when y'all see him doing one, say number one in the chat if y'all see that he's ignoring context. Number two in the chat if he's using pseudo etymology. And number three in the chat if he's poisoning the well. I'm trying to teach y'all how to see this stuff coming. Y'all going to see it for yourself. And that's what he's going to do all night long, nonstop, thinking he's doing something. Right? This is Isaiah 24 and 1. Let's get some context. Look what it says. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth it abroad, the inhabitants thereof. This is about a future universal judgment upon all people. This is not talking about no Haram. You know what I'm saying? This ain't talking about no Islam. But watch what else it says. Let's skip down and we're going to read 17 to 23. He said that's what a crucial point was. Look what it says. Fear the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. This is about some kind of universal punishment. Unless y'all believe that the Muslims are going to destroy the whole world and punish the whole world, which y'all very may well be. Y'all may believe that. I don't know. Right? And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that comes up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. This ain't talking about no Islam kingdom. It's about a universal judgment that God is going to bring on the whole earth. You're trying to narrow it down and make it about the Islamic empire. No, that is not what this is talking about. Then it says, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and shall not rise. You ain't got to read any more of this because you can see from the context that this is talking about a universal destruction. But what happens when God brings the universal destruction, right? It says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. The Lord, not Muhammad. The Lord is going to do this. Right on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in prison. And after many days, they shall be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed. When what? When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. This is talking about the children of Israel reigning in the kingdom at the end. You don't mention nothing about no Arabs, no Ishmaelites, none of that. I don't know where you're getting this from. This is, again, ignoring context. This is about the universal destruction and the deliverance of God's people who are the Israelites and the Christians. That's what this is talking about. Y'all keep trying to shoehorn y'all Arabs and y'all Muhammad into our text. We don't do that with the Quran. We let y'all have the Quran, but y'all, the Quran ain't enough for y'all. Y'all want y'all Quran and our Bible. That's what y'all want. We don't do that to y'all. And y'all got to put Muhammad in our, in our Bible because y'all Quran talks about Jesus too much. It's not fair. It's not fair that our book talks about your Jesus, but your book doesn't talk about our Muhammad. So we're going to put Muhammad in there. And that's what y'all doing. You're taking all of these verses out of context. You don't care about context when it comes to the Bible. But let me try to pull that crap in the Quran. You'll be all on my grass. Y'all don't care about context. But let's move on. Let's go to Isaiah 42 because, oh, my God, what was he thinking when he went to this one? This is Isaiah 42. And this is why he tried to poison the well, because he know that Matthew says that this was fulfilled by Jesus. He don't even understand dual prophecy, y'all. He think Matthew was ripping something out of context. He think the, the New Testament writers had every Old Testament manuscript. So also, that manuscript don't say that. It says he shall build Nazarene. You really think we got all of the manuscripts that the New Testament writers had? No, we don't. Even Muslims say that. Y'all be the first one to say, the Bible is mentioned. It's the same book. Y'all be the first one to say that. But then y'all see a New Testament writer reference something that's not in the Old Testament, and all of a sudden you forget that y'all said y'all self that we don't have all the information. 
So why you can't consider that when they quote something that we don't readily have available? So y'all don't think about that stuff, right? Well, this is Isaiah 42. Because see, the Bible interprets the Bible. They got to jump out the Bible 600 years into the future after the New Testament to get their Muhammad. We ain't buying that brand, bro. We ain't going for that. This is Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. He read this. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold. He tried, he tried to make this Muhammad, right? Mine elect, before you get to Isaiah 42, all of the Old Testament uh, writers of Isaiah 41, all the writings, all said that this was talking about the nation of Israel. All in Isaiah, Israel is called the servant. So if you're going to try to make this be anybody, you got to make this be the nation of Israel. How are you going to make this jump to the Ishmaelites, the Arabs? But look what it says. I have put my spirit upon him. See, they like that. His spirit, spirit upon him. See, that sound Muhammadan, right? Look what it says. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Last time I checked, Muhammad wasn't very quiet. He wasn't very quiet. But that's another argument all in of itself. Look what else he says. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flask shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. Remember, the whole point of this debate is proving if uh, by the Bible alone, if Muhammad is mentioned in the Bible, I'm using the Bible alone. Notice that when I show stuff referring to Jesus, I use the Bible to show it. He can't use the Bible to show it. Remember, Abraham, you know that. That was the title of, that was the, um, the stipulation of debate. You got to prove with the Bible. You are yet to prove with the Bible. You are yet to prove with the Bible that this is talking about Muhammad. You already failed and you went twice. You took the test twice and failed both times. The debate says you got to prove that in the Bible. You did not prove in the Bible yet. We're still waiting on that. You're telling us. That's what you said. Well, Muhammad did this. Muhammad did that. You ain't showed us in the Bible yet. There was the stipulation. But look what else it says. Right? In the earth and in the isles shall wait for his law. His law. You want to make his law be the Quran. No, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, because this, this is what you don't want to do. That's why you try to go ahead and poison Matthew real quick, y'all. But it don't make no difference. We Christians, we believe our Bible. You ain't going to be able to turn us against Matthew with that. Right? This is Matthew chapter 12, 16 to 20. Let's see what this prophecy is referring to. And charge them, talking about Jesus, that they should not make, his, not make him known. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Who's going to fulfill this servant prophecy in Isaiah 42? Look what it says. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. The author of Matthew is applying this to Jesus. He's not applying this to Muhammad. The title of this debate, the stipulation of this debate was proven Muhammad in the Bible. You can't do that. You failed. You haven't went to a Bible verse yet and show that this is Muhammad. Every proof you've given goes outside the Bible. You went to commentaries. That's Bible. Did you forget the stipulation already, my brother? That was the stipulation that I laid out. It has to be proven in the Bible. You cannot prove it in the Bible. You're just reading stuff and telling us this is Muhammad. That's why I said, if any Muslim challenged me on this and keep it in the Bible, their heads will, will roll. And right now, your head is on the other side of that room you're sitting in. It ain't on your shoulders anymore. So stop the games, bro. You know you have not proven that yet. But let's keep on reading to show you who this is. Know my servant who I have chosen. I'm the loved in whom I will, my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He, him, who, Jesus, not Muhammad. You don't got to like it. You don't got to believe it, but you can't deny it. You cannot deny it. This is saying this refers to Jesus. So what are you going to do later? Y'all know what he's going to do later? Y'all tell me in the chat which number he's going to pull later since I'm showing in the Bible that this is talking about Jesus. What number he's going to pull? He's going to pull number three. He got the parts in the well. He got discredited the Bible. That's what he got to do. That's what he's going to have to do after this. He's going to have to come back and be like, well, Matthew got it wrong. That's all they do. One, two, three. And that's what I'm giving them. The one, the two, and the three combo. That's all y'all give us. One, two, three. Watch what else. Y'all get the point. Let's go to Isaiah 29 because he messed this one up too. Oh my God. Stick to the Quran, bro. This ain't your dance. This ain't your dance, bro. 
Stick to the Quran, bro. You don't see me trying to challenge you in the Quran. See, I know how to stay in my lane. You feel me? I know how to stay in my lane. You don't see me going after you in the Quran. It's not stupid. You, do I look like going after Ibrahim in the Quran? No, but Ibrahim think he can check me in my lane. You know what I'm saying? Stay on your grass, bro. Stay on your grass. Isaiah 29, verse 1. Let's get some context. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. And ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices. This is about Jerusalem. Ariel is another name for Jerusalem. Let's get down and get some context. Let's go to 9 through 13. He tried to run the okie doke on us with this one. Look what it says. says. He didn't start at verse 9, though. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. Who's drunken? The Israelites, the wicked Israelites of that time. They were spiritually drunk. It said they were drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Why? For the Lord have poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, have he covered. So it's even letting you know right here that it's talking about there were no prophets in Jerusalem. You see why? Because they were wicked and he closed their eyes up. So that's another punch from you messing up Isaac, um, Psalm 74. But look what else he says. And the vision of all is becoming to you as the words of a book that is sealed. This is a bad thing. This is not promoting Muhammad. If you try to use it to promote Muhammad, don't you know you're disrespecting the prophet? Peace be upon him. If you try to make this refer to him, you don't even know that you're condemning your own prophet. That this is condemning somebody in this verse. Look what it says. And the vision of all is become unto you time, as a book. We both get a two minute warning, bro. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't see that in the thing. So if that's the case, that's my bad. You know what I'm just saying, well, let me just, let me just take 10 seconds to wrap it up. All right. So as y'all can see, so far, my opponent has not shown that Muhammad is in the Bible. He's grown outside the Bible, and that's what else he's going to continue to do for the rest of the debate. That's it for now. I'll be back. All right. All right. So that consists of both opening rounds, both opening rounds. So each brother will get a rebuttal round. It'll be on the brother Ibrahim. You know, he have 10 minutes and 30 seconds for his rebuttal. Just for the sake so everybody knows, I'll be, uh, I will, and when it's two minutes left, I'll be letting both parties know that there's two minutes remaining. I just didn't see it on the format, but I definitely do that on both sides. I think- uh, You don't have to brother, tell me, I have my own timer, it's fine. Okay, well, I'll definitely just, I'll just have to do it for the sake of everybody else. But okay. whenever you start, your time starts. Okay, one, two, three, go. All right, this is uh, probably going to be the easiest discussion I've ever had. I can't believe how easy this is going to be. So let's begin with his opening. He said that Muslims, we twist the Bible, twist the Bible, blah, blah, blah. So he made many claims, but he was not able to demonstrate any of them. He said we ignore context. He says we appeal to pseudo etymology. Uh, he was not able to prove any of this. He tried, and I'll show you how his attempts were really poor. But what's interesting is he says, Muslims, we ignore the context when we're saying these prophecies are about Islam. And guess what? I showed you Matthew in chapter 2, quoting Hosea 11, out of Egypt I called my son, where Matthew chopped off the first half of the verse, which says this is about Israel. Hosea was talking about the Exodus when Israel came out of Egypt. Uh, what, what, Matthew it totally ignored the context, he twisted the text, he chopped off half the verse, he pretended like a text that's speaking about the past, of, uh, the, when Israel came out of Exodus, he pretends like that's a prophecy about Jesus coming out of Egypt. So that ignoring the context that he accuses us of, actually the New Testament does. Okay, anyway, second thing he said, we appeal, we appeal to false like, pseudo-etymology. I never did that, in this debate at least, uh, there's not a single time I did that, that you could even make such a possible claim. But interestingly, that's exactly what the New Testament says. You remember I showed you that Matthew says that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene, and how this prophecy doesn't exist in the Old Testament, Matthew just made it up? Well, some scholars, uh, some evangelical Christian scholars, they try and find this in the Old Testament, and the closest they get to is Isaiah 11, which calls the Messiah Netzer, meaning branch, and they say, oh, Matthew was do just doing a pun, a wordplay on Netzer, branch, and he was just doing a wordplay and saying, oh, look, Netzer is like Nazarene, so Jesus will be called the Nazarene. So he accuses us of false etymology, where it's Matthew who says that Netzer, branch, means Nazarene, and he says this is a prophecy about Jesus, makes up a completely fake etymology, 
And so the exact things Joshua is accusing us of is what his New Testament does. He says, we poison the well and discredit Matthew. I'm sorry if you want to close your eyes, but Matthew is faking prophecies. He's taking stuff out of context. You can't just close your eyes, okay? We have to look at what the original context was. That is why I clarified over and over again at the beginning of this debate and with uh, Joshua privately and also in one of the promos, promos we did that really I'm a pro this debate is about was the prophet Muhammad foretold by the prophets, by the prophets, not literally in the Bible. That's just the title of the debate, but that's because it's easy to title it that. But really, we're asking, what did the prophet say? Matthew's not a prophet. He's just some random anonymous author that we don't know. And when he is clearly twisting the text, we don't have to take his interpretation and ignore the actual prophets. We look at the prophets. What did Isaiah really say? What did Hosea really say? That's what we look at. Let's look at his actual text now. So he says, we say the Bible's corrupted. Jeremiah 8, 8, Jeremiah says the Bible's corrupted, okay? Matthew, he changes Mark. Matthew is using Mark, as New Testament scholars say, and he used to edit it and change it. So Matthew himself thinks Mark uh, had problems, and so he edited it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, he says, he pretends there isn't a fifth kingdom. What is this guy on about? Uh, Daniel chapter 7, it talks about this kingdom like a leper, like a bear, uh, like a lion, uh, and, then, um, uh, and then one like a, a fourth beast, and then a kingdom that comes that is given to one like a son of man. So we have five kingdoms. That's why if you read Daniel chapter 2, you see Babylon, then uh, after that another kingdom will arise inferior to yours, then it says next a third kingdom, one of bronze will rule. Finally, there'll be a fourth kingdom, okay, so four pagan empires that make up the statue. And then verse 44, in the days of those kings, after mentioning all those four previous kingdoms, it says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. So after these four pagan empires, a fifth kingdom, the kingdom of God will come. So he, like, completely failed on Daniel 2 and 7. That's why there is a consensus. Every, literally every scholar agrees that Daniel is talking about five kingdoms coming, four pagans, and then a final kingdom of God. He tried to say, oh, but look, Daniel 7 says it's given to the Son of Man. This is another evidence that the New Testament fakes prophecies when it applies them to Jesus. Because if you read the end of Daniel 7, it interprets the one like a Son of Man and says that it's a reference to the saints of the Most High. Just like in Daniel, okay, so if you go to Daniel 7, let me show you this. If you go to Daniel 7, Daniel speaks about one like a leopard, one like a lion, uh, one like a... Uh, I'm hearing a lot of things, but anyway, one like a leopard, one like a lion, a one like a bear, and then he speaks about one like a son of man. So the one like a leopard is not a literal leopard, it represents a kingdom. The one like a bear represents a kingdom. The one like a son of man represents a kingdom. That's why at the end it explains that the one like a son of man is not a literal person, it is the kingdom. So the, he's trying to say, oh, Jesus, the son of man. Daniel itself tells you the son of man is not a human, it's a kingdom. So that's another example of the New Testament twisting prophecies. He says, oh, it says the kingdom is going to be forever. The, the, the Aramaic word there is Elam. If you look at the Hebrew, it's Olam. And this word is used all over the Old Testament. And many times it doesn't mean literally forever. It just means a very long period of time. For example, Joel chapter 2, I believe it's verse 27. Joel says Israel will never be ashamed forever. After talking about this army or this locust plague that invaded Israel, Joel says, okay, God's going to now save you from this, which he did, and then says, you will never be ashamed forever. Guess what? Israel was invaded many times after that, and there were many locusts attack on Israel after that. If you take Olam there in Joel 2.27 literally and say, oh, it literally means uh, uh, Israel will never be ashamed forever again, Joel becomes a false prophecy. The word in Hebrew there, olam, often just means a long time. In Psalm 45, it's used to describe a king's reign. It says it's going to be forever. That king was, it didn't reign forever. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. So uh, that word does not literally mean forever. And by the way, prophecies so often use hyperbole. Daniel 2 itself uses hyperbole when it describes Babylon. And it says that uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, all of mankind is under his dominion. That's, that's hyperbole. I can't believe he doesn't know this stuff. Okay. Uh, let's look at some other stuff. You know what's interesting about all this, uh, this thing? Oh, well, uh, uh, Matthew said, said it's Jesus, so it must be Jesus. Guess what? The, if you read the book of Joshua, it tries to apply the prophet like Moses' prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 to Joshua. If you read Jeremiah chapter 1, it tries to say that the prophet like Moses is Jeremiah. And that's why there are Jews who think the prophet like Moses is Joshua or Jeremiah. But guess what? Uh, Joshua doesn't care about that. He says it's Jesus. 
So the problem is you have different authors in the Bible claiming that different people fulfill different prophecies and they're often twisting these prophecies. The correct methodology is to look at the original prophecy and determine who does it actually fit. And then that person is the one who fulfilled the prophecy. Isaiah 9. Oh, he said, I, uh, uh, I forgot to tell you that it says, mighty God. No, I know the verse. It says, Ki yeled yuled lenu, ben nitan lenu, weyakara shemo, ele yo es, aviad, epele yo es, el gibor, aviad sar shalom. Guess what? Uh, saying that this means mighty God, the first thing is, even if we accept that translation, that same uh, el gibor is used in the plural in Ezekiel 32 21. It's used in the plural, ele giborim, to describe a bunch of men. Is that saying those men are gods? No. Secondly, Moses is called God in Exodus. Also, as the Jewish study Bible points out, these names are given to the child, but they're actually describing the God of the child. That's the historical context. As the Jewish study Bible points out, in the Jewish culture and in other Near Eastern cultures, names were given to children, but they would not be describing the child. They would be describing the God of the child. For example, there's a person in the Bible, his name is Jotham, which means Yahweh's perfect. Is that person Yahweh? No, it's describing his God. In Jeremiah, it says Jerusalem's name will be Yahweh our righteousness. Is that saying Jerusalem's Jerusalem is Yahweh? No. No, the name is describing the God of Jerusalem. Same thing in Isaiah 9. These names are describing the God of the child. And by the way, we don't even have to accept uh, your translation. The Septuagint doesn't have any of these names. It has messenger of great counsel. And there are different ways to translate this name. For example, there are those who uh, translate mighty God as uh, father as a uh, mighty God as hero warrior. Joseph Blankensop translates it that way. There are those who translate Everlasting Father as Father of War Spoils. Otto Kaiser translates it that way. So, okay, let's just go on. So he said Psalm 74 is not about the Babylonians. I have here with me uh, the Art Scroll Tanakh series, the commentary on Tehillim, and there they quote Sforno, a Jewish rabbi, saying it's about the Roman exile. Because as I explained, it does not fit the Babylonian exile. It says there are no prophets and we don't know how long this is going to last. They knew how long the Babylonian exile would last. Jeremiah told them it's only going to last 70 years. And he tried to appeal to some random text in Isaiah, etc., where it says that prophets will be taken away from Jerusalem. Well, what does that matter? We want to look at Psalm 74. What does Psalm 74 say? Psalm 74 does not say there are no more prophets left in Jerusalem. Psalm 74 says there are no more prophets left, period. What are you doing talking about Jerusalem? Look at Psalm 74 itself. Pay attention to the actual text. I don't know what this guy's on about. He tried to claim uh, Isaiah 24 is about the whole world because uh, he said the, wor uh, the word world is used, right? Or, or earth. The Hebrew is ha-eretz, which as... Um, Christopher B. Hayes points out in the origins of Isaiah 24-27, Eretz, in Hebrew, most often refers to land, the, the literal land here, not the entire earth. That's why many commentaries take the position that it's talking about the Roman exile. Some say the Babylonian exile, but the Roman exile is the one that actually fits. He says, Nazarene, oh, we don't have all the manuscripts of the Old Testament. So then you're admitting the Old Testament's corrupt. So why do you have a problem with us saying the Old Testament is corrupt? And there's not a single manuscript that says, uh, Messiah will be called Nazarene because Matthew made it up. That's simple. Okay, and I'm out of time. All right, all right. That concluded as far as the 10 minute and 30 second rebuttal round, first round. Brother Josh, when you start, your 10 minutes and 30 seconds will start. Brother Josh, you there? Can y'all hear him or is it just me? Is it? I, I won't let me have the two calls. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah, you're clear now. Yeah. I said that, um, can everybody in the chat hear me? Give me a W if everybody in the chat can hear me. Too. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you yeah, now. I can hear you at first, too. Okay. I was saying that if you want to, I want you, yo, when I get my two minute warning, I want you to actually come across, unmute yourself, and let me know. Right? Yeah, okay, getting back at it. As y'all can see, start me now. Okay, start my time. As y'all can see, my opponent is well. Uh, Joshua, you're cutting out. I don't know if that's just yeah. for me or. Yeah, Josh, you just went out again. You just went out again, Josh. Uh, he's well understand the context. Josh, that's when he went on real, this whole tirade trying. Real yeah. quick, Josh, you had yeah, you had cut out. If you could start over, so we could recess, so we couldn't hear. Start you. over. You know what I'm doing? Hey, Drake. I'm Drake. I'm, I'm gonna drop down and come back up because they usually fix it. I'm gonna drop down. Okay. Okay. Okay, how do I sound now? You sound clear. 
Am I good? Yeah, yeah. Everybody in the chat? W's on deck? Okay, cool. All right, starting now. My time's starting over. Okay, like I said, as y'all can see, my opponent is cooked. He is well done. At this point right here, all he's trying to do now is discredit the Bible. I told you he was going to poison the well. As long as he thought he had the correct interpretation of verses, he had no problem accepting the Bible. Every verse he went to, he believes it. He believes it. But when I showed that he didn't understand it, now he wants to try to get you to doubt Matthew. He doesn't understand dual prophecy. The Bible has something called dual prophecy, my brother, meaning it can refer to more than one thing. It can have a multiple fulfillment. You don't understand that. When you say if we don't have the entire manuscripts, that means the Bible is corrupt. Uh, did you know we don't got all parts of the Quran and that there are versions, several different versions of the Quran? If you want to play that game, that makes the Quran corrupt. So you're over there smiling because you know it's true. Because you know it's true, right? You know good and well that they don't have the complete versions of the Quran. Y'all can look this stuff up. But not having everything does not mean corrupt. So because you don't have everything at your disposal does not mean it's corrupt. It doesn't mean you don't have everything. But my point is, y'all notice that as soon as I got him off his square, what did he start doing? He started trying to discredit the Bible. Number three. And I saw y'all in the chat too. Y'all put them threes in there. Poison in the web. That's all he could do. But check this out right here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, 40 and 41. Because he's trying to take Jesus away as the head of the kingdom. See, what these Muslims try to do, they think they slick. They want to come in and take Muhammad and put him in the place of Jesus. That's why y'all notice that almost every place he went to, he tried to make it be Muhammad, not Jesus. That's what they're trying to do. Y'all are trying to steal the Messiah's glory and give it to your prophet. And we Christians are not falling for it. It's just not going to happen. Muhammad is not in this Bible. You said that I said that you are resorted, resorted to pseudo etymology. No, I didn't. I said that you would. I never said that you did. So that was a lie when you said that on me. You need to retract that. I said you would do that if we start dealing with the Holy Ghost and what they were comforting me. So you need to retract that statement. I never said that you did. I said that you would. Right? So this right here is Matthew chapter 13. Let's see who the kingdom belongs to. We're going to read verses 40 to 41. Look what it says. It says, I'm sorry, 41 to 42. It says, the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. And my brother Ibrahim knows good and well that when Jesus in the New Testament refers to the son of man, he's talking about himself and every Christian knows that. Notice he said his kingdom, not Muhammad's kingdom, not the Arab's kingdom, not Islam's kingdom. Stop trying to steal the glory of our Messiah and give it to your Muhammad. That's what we're asking y'all to do. Stop stealing. Y'all Biden, that's all Muslims do. Y'all steal everything. Y'all go in our Bible and y'all try to take stuff and, take, and steal it from Jesus and give it to Muhammad. Stop stealing our stuff. Your Quran should be enough. Y'all greedy. Y'all want our Quran and our Bible. You greedy, Abraham. Stop being a glutton. What else it says? And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. So the Messiah has the authority to send people to hell. Something that even the Quran says. And you know this. Oh, yes, the Quran called, is Jesus called the master of the day of judgment? Does he judge? If you judge, that means you decide who go to hell and who don't. That's another lesson, though. He's going to try to put his finger, no, 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 no. The Quran does say Jesus is going to judge. Yes, he does say that. I can pull that out, but it's another lesson. Right? We ain't going to deal with that today. Also, y'all notice, we are supposed to be proving from the Bible that my brother has shown that Muhammad is in the Bible. He has not done that yet. He doesn't understand what it means to prove something. Proof means you show from the Bible. The first thing he opened up with was some commentary. So I'm going to go to this commentary. Uh, Abraham, first to McFly, first to McFly, on commentary is not Bible. Bible, my brother, you're going to commentary. You're supposed to be proven from the Bible. What part of the Bible don't you understand? B-I-B-L-E, not commentary. You lost. That's why you're going outside of the Bible like I knew you would. You all, all you Muslims are the same. Y'all do the same thing. When you can't win in the Bible, you jump out the Bible. You're going to rabbi commentary. I don't care anything about any of that crap. Nobody, no Christian in the chat room cares anything about some rabbi commentary. This will be a Bible. Look at the title. Is Muhammad mentioned in the Bible, not in rabbinical commentary? 
So by default, you already lost this debate when you broke the rules because you went outside of the rules. It says in the Bible, rabbi commentary is not the Bible. Islamic commentary is not the Bible. You lost. Your pride won't let you deal with it. Take the L, bro. It's over. You lost the moment you did that, but I let you have that. Then you come back the second time and you do it even more. You double down. You've been lost. Eat it. Right? Now, let's go back to this Isaiah 29. Let's go to 19 because he don't even understand that this is discrediting whoever this is talking about. You can have all your little Muslim fanboys in the chat talking about, oh, yeah, you did. They can gaslight you, bro. But any real Muslim will say, man, you, you, got, cut, you got cut tonight, bro. Well done. Just like I like my steak. Well done. That's what you got, bro. You know good and well you ain't prove any of that. That's why all you're trying to do is discredit. That's all you do. He's poisoning the well. Watch when he comes back again. He's going to go after the, the credibility of the Bible. This, you know what you're doing? You're doing what Uthman tried to do. That's what you're doing. Uthman just wanted to do it in an official debate. You tried to slide it in. Y'all all the same, bro. Y'all all the same. And y'all all get cooked the same. Well done. This Isaiah 29, look what it says. We was at uh, verse 11. And the vision of all is becoming to you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Why can he not read it? Because God is punishing them by putting a deep sleep upon them. This is a punishment. Y'all put, put this on Muhammad like this is a badge of honor. This is a punishment. Anybody can see that. That's the context. But Abraham, my opponent, he don't care nothing about no context. He don't care nothing about no context. Context means nothing to him. Right? Look what else he says. Verse 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. They try to call Muhammad the unlettered prophet, and they try to get this. Saying, read this, I pray thee. And he says, I am not learned. This is talking about the children of Israel in Jerusalem. It starts out in verse 1 telling you that. You don't care about context. We cannot teach you, Muslims, if y'all don't care about context, except when it comes to y'all Quran. We can't teach you, bro. I can't teach. I can't get how many books on my shelf. I can't get a regular book and try to tell you what it means if you don't care about context. And y'all don't care about context. You don't. That's just the truth. Just admit that. We want this Bible to say what we want it to say. Right? But look what it says right here. This is Isaiah 28. 8 to 13. You went here too. I'm just cleaning up at this point. I'm just your custodian at this point. I'm just cleaning up your mess. That's what you did. You made a mess of things in your presentation. That's what you did. I'm just here to clean up, bro. You know what I'm saying? I'm a custodian. I see garbage and I go somewhere and I clean it up. I'm in my custodian bag right now. You know what I'm saying? And you don't took a dump all over the place. That's what you don't did. Right? This is Isaiah 28 verse 8 because you tried to go here too. And let me show you what this is starting off at. Look what it says. For all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. This is talking about the kingdom of Ephraim, the northern kingdom, right? Look what it says. The tables are full of vomit. It's not talking about literal vomit. It's talking about how God sees the children of Israel. Look what it says. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For a precept must be upon precept. You try to use this to try to say, this is talking about the revealing of the Quran. Little here, little there. No, this is a bad thing. You're condemning your prophet again. When you put this in context, this is a punishment. I'm going to show you that. You're going to learn, babe. It says, for precept must be upon precept. Precept no, upon minute. precept. Line upon line. Two minutes. Yes, sir. That what you say? Okay, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. What people? Israel. They were scattered all over the world and they had to learn different languages in their captivity. This is not talking about no Arabs. Y'all need to try to stop reading y'all Arabs and y'all prophets into our Bible. Hashtag Muslims is off our Bible. Hashtag Muslims off our Bible. We need to get that going. Look what else it says right here. Verse 12. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may rest, the weary that you may rest. This is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Look what it says, verse 13. But the, but the word of the Lord was upon them. Watch what happens when they do this precept things. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. What happens when the word is revealed to you like this? That they might go and fall forward. And be broken and snared and taken. So if you say the Quran was revealed like this, you're saying that Muhammad came to break and snare and make people fall and go backwards. 
You don't even understand when you make this refer to Muhammad, you are condemning Muhammad. So again, Abraham, to conclude, you still have not proven that Muhammad is mentioned in his Bible, and some of the places you even went to even condemns the prophet. Please be upon him. I'll be back. All right, all right. That would that concludes the first rebuttal of 10 minutes and 30 seconds. We're now going into the second rebuttal. Ibrahim, whenever you start, uh, obviously you're holding your time, but we are as well. Your time will start, good sir. The second rebuttal. Ring. Can y'all hear him, y'all, or is it just me? Is it, uh, I think he's anything? muted. Uh, yeah, I, I was no, muted. Gotta, um, muted. Mute. Restart, restart. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute. Okay. So one thing he said is that in, in some of these texts, like Isaiah 42, it says the Lord will punish. Oh, no, he was mentioning Isaiah 24. The Lord will punish the kings of the earth, not the prophet Muhammad and his companions. Uh, Joshua, maybe you don't know, but the Hebrew Bible uses agency, the concept of agency, where a, an agent of God does something and it can be attributed back to God. Let me give you an example. So this is Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. The land that the Lord is giving you. This is Joshua 22, 4. The land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. So Moses is the agent of God who gave the land. And because he's God's agent, the action can be attributed back to God. There's a text in the Bible that says that Yahweh incited David to do a census. There's another text that says Satan incited David to do a census. So either Satan is the agent of Yahweh or Yahweh is Satan. You can make your mind up on that. He said, oh, Muhammad wasn't very quiet, like Isaiah 42 says. Literally, it says he will not shout or cry out out of grief, as the international critical commentary explained that the servant will not cry out of grief, which perfectly matches the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He did not complain even when his children died. And it says he won't raise his voice in the streets. His wife said he didn't used to do that. And the rabbis of Medina admitted he didn't used to do that. What he's trying to say is he's trying to say, oh, the prophet Muhammad was a warrior, was a military man, so he can't fulfill this. Well, jo uh, Joshua, you believe that when Jesus comes back, he's going to kill all the Jews. According to Luke 19, Jesus says when he comes back, he's going to say, bring all those Jews that didn't want me to be king. I'll kill all of them. Does that sound like Jesus is going to bring them in the land and restore Israel? Not according to Luke 19. Also in Matthew 24, Jesus comes and says he's going to send his messengers and, and burn all his enemies. Is that is that a military person? It's more violent than the prophet Muhammad. Thank you very much. Isaiah 42 is just saying he's not going to raise his voice in the street. He's going to be of good character. It's not saying he's not going to be a military warrior. That's why later on it literally says the Lord will go out like a warrior, etc. Uh, he says... Oh, I'm not showing like some text in the new, in, like New Testament that's saying, oh, look, this is about Muhammad, like some person, L like how the New Testament authors say that's about Jesus. So he wants there to be in the Bible a prophecy and then some author writing saying that Muhammad is the fulfillment of this prophecy when the prophet Muhammad didn't live. Like what kind of ridiculous logic is that? And this logic rules out Jesus because uh, how are you going to prove Jesus in the Old Testament when you don't have some author in the Old Testament writing and saying, oh, look, this is about Jesus. No, you just have prophecies and then people see them fulfilled in the time of Jesus and in the time of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He says, why are you bringing scholars? Why are you bringing commentaries? I'm sorry, Joshua, you can't even read Hebrew. It's pretty obvious. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have made the massive mistake on Eretz. And uh, like this idea that you didn't know that the verse uh, eternal God has many different renditions. Where do you get the Hebrew Bible text? Where do you get it from? You get it from scholars. Textual criticism. Where, who can read the manuscripts? Who gets the text for us? It's the scholars. Joshua, I'm sorry. You cannot read your text without scholars. And then you want to complain about scholars. Scholars are academic scholars who studied the text forever and they write commentaries for us so we can better understand the text. I'm not appealing to an authority. I'm just showing that my explanation is correct. I'm showing how it logically makes sense and then i'm showing you academic confirmation of these things whereas you joshua you can't even read these texts without scholars you know nothing about the textual transmission of the bible that's why you said in one of those videos in the same video i think where you challenged uh, uh for the debate you said that we have all of the new testament from the first century in patristic citations which is absolute nonsense we actually don't have any citation of the gospels until the late second century as scholars like Mark and, marcus vincent point out and everyone knows this jack bull knows this the only the Pauline epistles are quoted. They don't quote the Gospels at all. They just quote sayings of Jesus. So you don't know anything about these languages, these texts, etc. And then you want to complain about scholars. I see it 29. Uh, he's, he, he started quoting verse 11 and 12. I didn't quote verse 11 and 12. I quote verse 18, which says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of a book, and out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. 
And then it says that Israel will not be ashamed. Israel will be happy. They, you'll see your children, etc. Does that sound like punishment? He's trying to say Isaiah 29 is negative. No, the section I quoted is very positive. And then he started quoting the part about Jerusalem uh, being destroyed, etc. I'm sorry, go to any commentary. That section is uh, different from the section I quoted. I quoted section 17 to 24. And this is a section, it begins in verse 15, you have two lines in the time of Isaiah, then we have a time, a positive time coming. I quoted the positive part. You're quoting a previous section, look at how Joseph Blankensaw breaks down Isaiah 29 structure. Isaiah 29, 1 through 9 is what, uh, 1 through 8 is like one section, 9 to 14 is one section, and then four, 15 to 24 is the final section. I quoted the final section. Like, this is just embarrassing. I didn't even quote verse 11 and 12, and you spent your whole entire time on verses 11 to 12. And by the way, Isaiah often switches between the present and the future. Like, Isaiah 1, very negative. Isaiah 2, a future, and then negative. Then Isaiah 3, negative. Isaiah 4, positive. Then Isaiah 5, negative. Isaiah 6, the call. Isaiah 7, uh, you have a, a, a promise, but you also have a negativity. Isaiah 8, negative. Isaiah 9, positive. Isaiah 10, negative. Isaiah 11, positive. Isaiah 12, positive. So the current bad situation, then the future promise. That's what's going on in Isaiah 29 and 28. Uh, Isaiah 29, sorry. You have punishment, 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 but at the end, the promise of positivity is mentioned. And that's why Isaiah 32 also has this positive future, in, uh, and Isaiah 35 also has this positive future so Isaiah is comparing the positive future with his current time. As for Isaiah 28, uh, okay, so also uh, Isaiah 28 verse 18, uh, ver Isaiah 29, Isaiah 29 verse 18, it's not the same book as in verses 11 to 12, because it doesn't say the book, referring back to verses 11 and 12, it says a book, and as Joseph Blankensop and the pulpit commentary mentioned, we don't know what this book is, because the article, the definite article is not used. Isaiah 28, he appeals to, again, the fact that in the beginning it talks about punishment, etc. Yeah, that's talking about Ephraim being punished at that time. But then we have a very specific prophecy. Because they mocked Isaiah, God is now going to send his revelation in a way that it's in a foreign language. It's going to have letters of the alphabet and it's going to be revealed little by little. And yeah, he said that, Isaiah says that this is going to be a stumbling block for the people of Israel. And uh, they will be... Taken, cap uh, taken captive and snared and captured, etc. Guess what? That's exactly what happened to the Jews of Medina. The Quran, it came in Arabic, and that was a stumbling block for the Jews. They didn't like it. They wanted a Hebrew revelation to an Israelite prophet. And that's why they rejected the Prophet Muhammad. They said, why is this Arab getting revelation? Why is this Arabic Quran being revealed? It was a stumbling block for them. And as a result, the Jews of Medina were punished. And they were taken captive. And they were punished. And after that... After the initial audience of Jews rejected, then the later Jews accepted the message and the majority of Jews became Muslims as we know, the, the lost tribes, all those places where they were exiled, etc., the lost tribes, etc., assimilated and became Muslims. Okay, uh, so by saying that the Isaiah 28, that the word of God is going to make them stumble and it's going to be a stumbling block for them and they're going to be punished, that fits Islamic history. The Jews didn't like that the word of God was in Arabic and that led to them being punished by the Muslims. And that, those are the Jews for whom the word of the Lord came little by little, because those are the ones that were alive when the Qur'an was being revealed little by little. Later on, the Muslims went out and saved the other Jews in Palestine, etc. Okay. He, he, he's, trying to, he's trying to say, oh, why are you like trying to poison the well or the Bible? I'm sorry, but scholars agree that the Bible contradicts itself. You are imposing your own ideas of that the Bible agrees with itself onto the Bible. The Bible never says it all agrees with itself. The Bible even never claims that all of it is inspired. You're, you're reading your own theology into the Bible, which is not in the Bible itself. The Bible often contradicts itself. Let me give you an example. This is uh, uh, Deuteronomy 12. It says that the Israelites can only sacrifice in the temple. Exodus 20, on the other hand, says that you can sacrifice anywhere I cause my name to be honored. The Jewish study Bible says, in every place, this law permits numerous places of sacrifices. Contrast the later restriction of sacrifice to a single site in Deuteronomy chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 6 verse 3, it says the the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, etc. didn't know the name Yahweh. But if you go to Genesis, like Genesis 15, Abraham is naming mountains after Yahweh, etc. So the Bible contradicts, did the patriarchs know the name Yahweh or not? So the point here is the Bible doesn't have one opinion. There are different authors who sometimes disagree with each other. Okay, you 
are reading into the Bible the idea that they all agree, which is not in the Bible at all. So I'm actually going to the Bible and reading the text for what they say. You are reading your own theology that the Bible never contradicts and all of it is inspired, which is found nowhere in the Bible. Even 2 Timothy does not say that all scripture is God-breathed. What it actually says is scripture is life-giving. Origen made up the idea that it says God breathe. The word does not mean that. For, he appeals to dual prophecy. So basically, he admits that uh, Isaiah 7 and all these texts that don't match Jesus at all and are taken out of context, they have nothing to do with Jesus. But then he tries to give this fancy, oh, dual prophecy. Yeah, dual prophecy is a very, very, very unconvincing. That's what happens when you know a text cannot be salvaged. So you put, oh, it's going to happen twice. He says we don't have all the Quran. Mar Marian Van Putin, an Orientalist, says we have 100% of the Quran in the first century. Uh, not my fault that you know nothing about the textual transmission of the Quran or the Bible. Everyone knows we have all the Quran. That you are just extremely ignorant on this. He says the kingdom is Israel's. Guess what? In Matthew 21, Jesus said the Jews, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to another nation. And this nation will bear its fruits. So the kingdom was taken from the Israelites and given to the Ishmaelite nation. Jesus doesn't say it's going gonna, it's gonna to be given to the nations in the plural. It's, he says it's going to be given to a nation, a single nation, which is the Ishmaelite nation. Uh, also, he says I'm not appealing to the Bible. I appeal, So many texts I appeal to, Isaiah 9, Daniel 2, etc. All of these are in the Bible. What are you talking about? And that's my time. That concludes the second rebuttal of Brother Abraham's time. Brother Joshua, you start your second rebuttal. Your time will start. Um, by the way, what? how much time is the second rebuttal? I forgot. Ten, ten minutes and time. 30 seconds. Ten minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, you can start now, right? Once again, if y'all pay attention and if y'all looking at the chat, everybody put all these threes in the chat. You know why? Because I've already planted the seed and they can see what you're doing. All you're doing is poisoning the well. You're digging yourself into a deeper ditch. You're trying to make an argument from a book that you're condemning at the same time. That makes you double-minded. That makes you schizophrenic. That makes you disassociative. Don't you understand that? That's what you're doing. All you're doing, this is all Muslims do. I like that. Thumbs up. I don't like that. Correct. Tamper with it. Y'all, it's called cherry picking. It's not scholarly, and it shows no sign of integrity. Every verse he went to, all I did was put it in the proper context. That's all I did. That makes him mad. When I give proper context, they discredit the whole book. It's like two kids on the basketball court dribbling the ball. The one keeps dunking, keeps getting all the shots on the other kid. So what does he do? He blames the ball. The ball ain't inflated enough. Something's wrong with the ball. That's what he's doing. When he can't win the game, he want to discredit the basketball. I don't do that. My game is just that good. He keep breaking his ankle trying to check me on his on court, and now he want to blame the ball. These verses are not saying what you're saying, and you're putting words in my mouth. He even saying stuff that I didn't even say in past um, discussions. I didn't even say this stuff. This is You know what this is? This is Oofman Light. You know how you got like a, a light form of a diet? Like, you know, this is diet Oofman. You were doing good at first, and then you did the same thing Oofman tried to do. You tried to turn around and make this about a Bible-bashing debate. You still have not proven Muhammad in the Bible. I did not discredit scholars. I said, I don't believe rabbinical commentary. That is not a source for me as far as like definitive. Will I look at it? Yes. Will I consider it? Yes. But in your presentations on your own video, every Christian scholar that you ever referenced, and y'all can go look this up, they don't agree that that's talking about Muhammad though. See, you go to Christian scholars to help boost your, your argument, but they don't reach the conclusion that it's Muhammad. So that makes you deceitful or that makes you ignorant. You can't use somebody else's material to prove your argument and then reach a different conclusion. That's what you did in your videos. I saw your videos, bro. You're quoting all these Christian scholars in commentary, right? But none of these Christian scholars that you are quoting believe that Muhammad is prophesied anywhere in this Bible. Go, if you don't believe me, go in any of those places you went to in your video where you're quoting a Christian scholar and they reach a conclusion that's talking about Muhammad. It's like you going in my diary, reading my notes, and telling me I don't know what I'm talking about. And that's what you did. Anybody can see that. Go on Proven Islam, go on his channel, look at him. He loves Christian scholars, but he don't get the conclusions they reach. That's very messed up. As for Isaiah 29, I said I'm not going to be able to get with everything that you went to. 
I said that. Can't deal with everything and get my time in at the same time. The bottom line is this. You are cooked. You have not proven anything. Rabbi commentary is not the Bible. I know about the Hebrew word eres. I know it can refer to a certain part of land or if it can refer to the whole earth. I know that. If you read Isaiah 24, it gives you the context. The context lets you know if it just come out the land or the whole earth. What does the context? See, that's number one. You ignore context. You didn't look at the context of it. You look at that whole chapter. The context talks about a universal destruction. Also, if you look at what it says about Islam and you read Isaiah 24, none of these things are talking about Islam. All they're talking about is the restoration of God's people. The Hebrew Israelites and the Christians that latch on with them. Y'all keep trying to steal our glory and you're mad because we are too savvy for you. You will never pull Muhammad off this Bible. You've gone everywhere but the Bible. You're reading verses. I've never said you're not reading verses, but you're not proving it's talking about Muhammad. And then when I show you in the Bible that these prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus, now you want to discredit the Bible. That's all you're doing. Isaiah 42 talking about um, Jesus. Go to Matthew and prove that. Well, you can't believe Matthew. Oh, so we're supposed to believe you then, though. We're supposed to believe Abraham come in. We're supposed to believe you. But here's the funny thing about it. It doesn't say he's talking about Muhammad either in the Quran. At least our texts support what we say. Our text lets us know. But let me show you something else that you messed up. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22. See, this is sad. This is sad when all you can do is guesstimate. This is sad when all you can do is guesstimate. That's all you can do. I think it's talking about Muhammad. It's not talking about Muhammad. This is Matthew 22. He went there to try to say this is talking about Islam. This is talking about the final judgment and what Jesus is going to do. Look at this. This is Matthew 22. I'm going to scroll down because he don't understand why I'd be starting earlier than where he went because I'm giving context. You go to verses later on, 17 and 18. That's why I start earlier. So you can get context. I don't have to read everything you read. If I get the verses early to get context, that's how people know. I know what I'm talking about and you don't. I don't have to read everything you go to. I go to the earlier verses and then they read the rest of it and they say, oh, this is what this is talking about. What you want me to do is just read what you read and we play a back and forth on which one of us is right. No, I read verses up to get context and then the people can see which one of us is telling the truth. You don't know how to do that. Not in the Bible. In the Quran, you sick with it. I've seen you in action. You sick with it in the Quran, but y'all play by different rules when it comes to the Bible, and you know it, Ebrahim. Don't even try to play like you don't. Y'all play by completely different rules. That is not fair. I cannot do this crap in the Quran that y'all do in the Bible. Y'all will not let me get away with that, and I wouldn't try to do it. But when it comes to our Bible, y'all want to make it say whatever it y'all want it to say. But it's Matthew 22. We're going to start reading at 9 to 13 to give y'all some context. Because he was talking about this marriage supper. He tried to make this. Amazingly, he tried to make this about Muhammad. Wow! Look what it says. Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. What marriage? So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. What wedding? This talking about the kingdom of Islam or the nation of Islam? Let's see what it's talking about. And when the king came in a in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Verse 12. And he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, find him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Every Christian who reads the gospel knows when it talks about somebody being punished with ripping and gnashing of teeth, that is talking about hellfire. That's what this is talking about. To show you all over the gospels, when they talk about people weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's talking about them being thrown to hell. This ain't talking about some earthly kingdom. You tried to make this be about Muhammad? It's talking about Jesus punishing people by throwing them in the hellfire. And right now, you got a look of somebody who just got thrown in the hellfire. I can see it on your face. I can see the defeat on your face. You know you could. You can see it on his face. You know you haven't proven anything. And you went twice. You got two shots at this. Swung and a miss. Swung and a miss. That's what you did. Twice. We sat through your presentation twice. And you achieved nothing. You still haven't proven anything. All you're doing is telling us what these verses say. You can say whatever you want to about the Bible. 
I really don't care. But well, one thing you can't disagree me, with me on, no Muslim can disagree with me on, is that the Bible does say what I say it's saying. You read stuff in the Bible and you just dismiss it because you don't like what you see. You don't like that Matthew says that Isaiah 42 is talking about Jesus. But you can't deny that it says it's talking about Jesus. I don't care if you like it. I want you to tell me Matthew was not saying that's talking about Jesus. I don't have to like your Quran. So what you want me to do is show me. You want to uh, you want me to show you that the Quran doesn't say what I claim to say. You say what? And I just said two Angel. minutes remaining. Appreciate that. Right? That's the whole thing about it. Muslims don't like what they see. When we show you that these prophecies are talking about Jesus, y'all just be like, well, I don't believe Matthew. What kind of what kind of debate is that? What kind of discussion is that, Ibrahim? Let's talk about the Bible until I see something that I don't like. Isaiah 42, Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9, Jesus. All of these places you went to that's talking about an individual, Jesus, 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 not Muhammad. You might be able to, um, you know, to convince a few Muslims about this stuff, but we Christians know better. And that's what really make y'all mad because y'all can't convince us of this stuff. That's what y'all really want to do. Y'all want to come in. That's what you said in your intro. If y'all, if we can show this to you, then we prove that you got to believe Muhammad. That's your whole goal. That's your end game. And you can't do it. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at the Bible. If my Bible says Isaiah 52, 42, it's talking about Jesus, then that's what I'm rolling with. If my Bible says Deuteronomy 18 and 18, it's talking about Jesus, then that's what I'm rolling with. I'm not going to dismiss my Bible because Abraham is throwing a temple tax. That's it for now. All right, that concludes the second rebuttal. We're going to go into the cross-examination, which will be seven minutes each. There'll be two as well. So this is going to be a set, <coughs> excuse me, a seven minute cross examination. There will be a one minute maximum of uninterrupted time for each respondent to answer the question. So each respondent or whoever the question is posed to gets a minute uninterrupted to answer and a yes or no question must be answered with a yes or no. So again, that is a one minute response time and the time doesn't stop on another side as far as the seven minute time. So whoever I believe it's uh, so Abraham first to pose this question. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, Joshua, just I, I think you should just like open your video and stuff too, right? Yeah, uh, you're muted. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, I'm here. Okay, so let me just uh, is the timer person ready? I'm just gonna start in like five seconds. Yep, we're ready. Okay, great. One, two, three, go. Pastor Joshua, you agree Daniel 2 and 7 speak about a number of kingdoms coming, right? Say that again. Daniel, Daniel 2 and 7 speak about a bunch of kingdoms coming? Daniel 2 and verse 7, yeah, it talks about four kingdoms. Yeah. Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greek, Roman, yes. Yeah, and now it says after the Roman Empire, the kingdom of God will arise, right? Yes, it said, after that kingdom shall the kingdom of God arise, they shall last forever and shall be given to one like unto the Son of Man. Uh, I've addressed all that come in my cloud. rebuttals. Please stick to the actual questions. Now, you agree well, well, that... I can ask, I, wait, 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 wait. I can on. answer the question any way I want, long as I say yes or no first. You can't tell hey. me how to answer my question. I can, well, I I can comment I whatever I want as well. I, I just thought you remember, yeah, both parties, yeah, if you a question is posed, the, uh, whoever's answering does. As long as he answers with a yes or no, if that's what you ask, that they do get a, a minute up to a minute uninterrupted. They don't have to take it, but they do. I get understand, that but uh, I, I can comment whatever I want as well. You can, but you just have to let him get his minute. You can uh, okay. comment. So before, you start, before you start the timer, I just want to set it up again. Uh, what we mm -hmm. agreed, and then I'll continue. So sure. basically, uh, in the beginning of the cro so that we have the same flow. So we agreed that Daniel speaks mm -hmm. about a bunch of kingdoms, and the kingdoms are Babylon, then Persia, Medo Persia, then Greece, then Rome, and then Daniel speaks about a kingdom of God coming after this Roman Empire. Okay. Yes, that's the kingdom. Yeah. Yes, that is the kingdom of. I'm answering your question. That is the kingdom of heaven that Jesus spoke about, and that Daniel. Um, chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14 talk about. I know there are four earthly kingdoms, but the kingdom after that is the eternal kingdom that Jesus is going to rule over. Okay, let me go on to my next, next question. So, uh, 
obviously historically an Islamic empire arose and this came after the Roman Empire, right? Yes. And uh, isn't it true that in the year 1453 CE, the Muslims finished off the Roman Empire, they ended it? As far as I know in my history, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Daniel says that the kingdom of God will defeat the Roman Empire, correct? Then you said a kingdom of God that will last forever and be ruled over by the son of man would defeat the Roman Empire. Yes. Right. So uh, Daniel said a kingdom of God will defeat the Roman Empire. Um, now, you also agree, obviously, that when Jesus was on earth, he didn't set up a, a kingdom, right? A political empire? Not a literal one, but the New Testament makes it clear that he spoke of both a spiritual kingdom and a literal kingdom. And he spoke of a kingdom in which he would rule spiritually and reign over his servants and they would defeat sin. And he speaks of another one that the New Testament talks about, which is going to be a physical, literal kingdom. And Daniel touches on both. Yeah, so Jesus didn't set up a literal kingdom, right? When he was on earth? Again, he did not set up a literal kingdom the first time he came. But the Bible and the Quran makes it clear that Jesus is going to come back. And, yeah, and when he when comes Jesus... back, he's going to set up another kingdom. Right. Yes. And when Jesus was on earth, he didn't fight the Romans, right? Not physically, no. And in fact, Jesus, you would say, actually encouraged submission to the Romans, right? Yes, he told them to render to Caesar that which is Caesar and render to God that which is God. Yes. In fact, you would actually say that uh, Roman... Uh, that the Roman general Pontius Pilate killed Jesus, right? Or he was killed under uh, the Roman governor, right? That is correct. But Jesus told Pilate, you have no power to do anything to me unless it was given to you. So even though Jesus submitted himself to Pilate's authority, he still let Pilate know that I have more authority than you. I'm just submitting to your authority because you wouldn't even be able to do anything to me that you're doing unless it was allowed. Right, That's but all Testament. I wanted to get at is that basically we agreed, uh, essentially with Daniel, that Daniel speaks about a coming kingdom of God after the Roman Empire. It's going to defeat the Roman Empire. We both agreed Jesus didn't set up a kingdom. We both agreed he actually said you should submit to the Roman Empire. We both agreed that the Muslims brought a kingdom after Rome. We both agreed that the Muslim Empire defeated Rome. We both agreed Daniel says the kingdom of God would defeat the Romans. Obviously, you had some own extra input, but I think that's a lot of common ground. So I, I want to actually go on to another topic now. Um, now, you agree with me that a number of texts in Isaiah speak about the Israelites coming back into Jerusalem, right? Like Isaiah 42, Isaiah 35, etc. Yes, it talks about um, Israel being brought back into the land, led by the Most High himself. Yeah, and obviously when Jesus was on earth, he didn't bring Israelites back in the land, right? No, he did not. Actually, after Jesus came, the opposite actually happened, right? The Romans kicked the Israelites out of the land and the exile started, right? Exactly what Jesus prophesied would happen in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Right, and obviously Muslims did bring Israelites back in the land, right? Not all of them, and neither does it fit the description. Well, let me ask first. No, not all of them, and neither does it fit the description of what is given in prophecy as far as Israel dwelling safely. If you would have read all of the prophecies about Israel being brought back into the land, one of the things it said they would do was they would not dwell in fear and they would dwell there safely. We both know historically and now Israelites are not dwelling safely and without fear in the land. We both know that. Well, let me read out to you a couple quotes. So this is from Moshe Gale's A History of Palestine. This is a Jew, Daniel al uh, uh, an old... Uh, not, 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 to be, not to be, but that's not Bible. You're breaking the rules again. I'm you have to prove it in the Bible. History. I'm but, I mean, but I will, here. you know what? I will allow it. I will allow it. Go ahead. I'll allow it. So this is what a Jewish rabbi says from the, in the ninth century. For be before he came, the king of Ishmael, Umar, who defeated the king of the south, that is the Roman emperor, the Israelites could not come to Jerusalem and they would come from the four corners of the earth to Tiberias and Gaza to see the ruins and the temple and cry. Once a year, this would happen. But now with his coming, Umar, uh, he brought them to Jerusalem and gave them a place and many of Israel settled there and afterwards Israel came from the four corners of the earth to Jerusalem to preach and to pray. And then here's another uh, Jew, this is Soleim ibn Rohim. 
Uh, he writes this in his commentary on the Psalms, again, early Jew. As we know, the temple remained in the hands of the Romans for more than 500 years, and the Jews did not succeed in entering Jerusalem, and anyone who did and was recognized as a Jew was put to death. But when the Romans left it, by the mercy of the God of Israel and the kingdom of Ishmael was victorious, Israel was permitted to come and live. So you agree, based on this historical uh, information, that there were Israelites who came back into the land after the Muslims, correct? And there were Israelites who viewed this as a mercy from God. Yes, but again, that is not the fulfillment of prophecy. Just because Israelites, some of them, go back to the land by their enemies, bringing them back, that does not mean that it's the fulfillment of what we're reading in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The prophets make it very clear that there are all kinds of other things that must be in play to prove that it is fulfilled, one of which is that Israel will reign on the top. They will be at the top of the food chain and that they will dwell safely. It, it, um, Islamists do not believe that. They do not believe and, that and, Israel will be at the top. They yeah. believe they will be at the top. And once again, just because my time is running out, you agree Jesus didn't bring Israelites in the land, right? And he did it set up a literal physical kingdom, right? No, he did not. The first time he did not come. But as you and me both know from the Bible and the Quran, it speaks of Jesus coming back. And the Bible, okay, that, the that's New actually Testament, time, Josh. So, oh, wait, I got to finish. I have to finish. Let me, finish. Let me get it out. Let me get it out. It's and, as, and as you know, because you've talked to Christians before, you do know and understand that there are Christians that believe that Jesus fulfilled some prophecy the first time around and more prophecy will be fulfilled when he comes back. That's okay, what I'm so, telling but, you. But Jesus, when he was on earth, didn't bring a kingdom. He didn't bring Israelites into Jerusalem. The prophet Muhammad brought a kingdom. He brought Israelites back to Jerusalem. That's really just the point I was trying to make. And, and, and that's time. time. Up, so. Yeah, that's time with y'all. And if and if at any point, uh, Abraham, if you're answering a question at the end when Josh asks you some, you'll get to finish out your thought also. Uh, oh, so okay. yep, that was the that was the conclusion of the seven minute cross examination. The brother Abraham was posing his questions. Now, brother Josh gets to pose his questions to brother Abraham. Remember, yes or no has to be answered. Yes or no. Uh, the answer, the one answering, does get a minute to answer uninterrupted. So, Josh, when you start, your time to start. Okay, um, Ibrahim. Do you believe that Muhammad is the comforter spoken of in John 14 and verse 26? Yes, in my personal opinion, I do believe that the Parakletos is a reference to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, although I also uh, uh, agree that it is possible that one could interpret the text as talking about Gabriel, the Holy Spirit in the Quran, who dwelt, who basically brought revelation to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But, uh, and that's how it was fulfilled because there were ancient christians some of them thought that the paraclete prophecy was fulfilled through like a human who came like marcion or montanus or paul or whatever and others thought that like it was about a spirit who dwelt in one of these figures so my personal opinion is it's a reference to the prophet muhammad peace be upon him but i think if someone wanted you could also interpret it as referring to the holy spirit who dwelt within the prophet muhammad and that's how it was fulfilled okay in john 14 and verse 17 jesus tells his apostles even the spirit of truth, whom the world, talking about the comforter, whom this world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither know of him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Question, did Muhammad dwell with and in the apostles? Uh, yes, he dwelt with them and in them in the sense that Jesus is speaking about, which is that Jesus saying, when Jesus says he's going to dwell in you, uh, etc., he's speaking about l metaphorically dwelling in them. And we know this because in the very next chapter, John 17, Jesus prays to the Father and says that he prays that the believers, like the disciples, etc., that they would be in the Father and in Jesus, just like I, Jesus, am in you. So he's saying that the disciples will be in the Father and in Jesus. Obviously, the disciples are not literally in God, in God, you know, it's a metaphor. So in that sense, yes, uh, the prophet Muhammad upon him, did dwell in the Christians. Okay, in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus tells his apostles, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comfort will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Did Jesus send Muhammad to the apostles? The apostles back then he was talking to. Did he do that? Um, so uh, there's sort of two questions there. Uh, the sending part. And Is this the, the question? Okay, let me, let me, let me, okay, here's the question. 
Jesus, I'm telling you, it's Jesus told me. I have a yes to part A and a no to part B. Okay, I'm asking you, the apostles that he was talking to, Jesus told them he's going to send the comforter to them. They got to be the first to get it. Did they get Muhammad? Did they meet Muhammad? Did they know Muhammad? Did he send Muhammad to them? Yes or no? Okay, so no, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, did not come to the disciples who were standing in front of Jesus. But he did come to the later believers in Jesus, and that's all that Jesus means when he's talking to you. When he says you, it's not limited to the actual followers of Jesus standing there. It's also talking about the uh, followers of Jesus that are going to come afterwards. The same thing is happening in Deuteronomy 18, 15, where Moses is speaking to the Israelites who are standing there, and he says, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from within your brothers. Now, Christians think, uh, think that's a reference to Jesus. But Jesus didn't literally come to those Jews standing in front of Moses. When Moses said you, he just meant my followers, basically the Israelites throughout the generations. One of those generations, he would come to them. And in the same sense, when Jesus says the Spirit will come to you, he's not literally has to mean the disciples standing there, just the Christian followers and the Prophet Muhammad came to them. As for the sending part, in John 14, it's, uh, it explains the way he's going to send them. Is Jesus says, I'm going to pray to the Father and he will send the Comforter. So that's how Jesus sent him, by praying to God, and then God is the one who sent. Wow. Okay, that was some garbage, but just to move on, this is John 14 and verse 18. Jesus told the apostles, I will not leave you comfortless, right? And he did not leave them comfortless because he said he was going to bring the Holy Ghost to them. If Jesus did not give the apostles at that time the Holy Spirit, did he leave them comfortless? Did he break his promise? So he told them the comforter would comfort them. That's what he said. Them. And he would not leave them comfortless. If, and let me ask, and here's the question. If they, the apostles back then, did not get the comfort of the Holy Spirit, did Jesus lie to them when he told them he would not leave them comfortless? No, because number one, they get the comfort of knowing that the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of Truth, is going to come. By the way, the Assumption of Moses is a first-century text which calls Moses the Holy Spirit, so Holy Spirit can be used for a human being. Uh, anyway, again, this is the same thing that when Jesus is speaking to his disciple, uh, disciples, it's not limited to those standing there. It can be a reference to Christians who come afterwards, just like in Deuteronomy eighteen fifteen, Moses is speaking to the Israelites standing right in front of him. But unless you believe the prophet like Moses was Joshua, which you don't believe that, you believe it was Jesus, uh, it, it doesn't make sense unless... Moses not it's not limited to the Jews standing in front of Moses, but it's also about the Jews that come after. It's the same thing in Isaiah 9, by the way, where Isaiah says, a son has been born to us. Now, you think that's Jesus. I say it's, I argued it's the prophet Muhammad. Regardless, neither Jesus nor the prophet Muhammad were born in the time of Isaiah, yet Isaiah says us, because us includes the Israelites who would come afterwards, slash the Gentiles, whoever us includes there. So it, it's that. And it's remaining too. Saying. Is there how much two minutes remaining? Yes, sir. Okay, in John 20 and 22, Jesus, it says, and when he said this, he breathed on them, his disciples, and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. So he told them they are going to receive the Holy Ghost. Did, and if you say the comforter is Muhammad, which is the Holy Ghost, did the disciples receive the comforter before Muhammad came? But they just said Jesus breathed on them and said, you receive the Holy Ghost. Did they receive the Holy Ghost before Muhammad came? And that's the comforter. Um, first of all, I believe it says they received the Spirit. Okay, it says Holy Spirit. Sorry. Yes, they received that Holy Spirit, but they did not receive the Holy Spirit known as the Paraclete in John 16. And we know this because John 16 verse 7 says, Truly I tell you, it's good for you that I go away. Unless I go away, the Paraclete will not come to you, but if I go, I'll send him. So this implies the Paraclete will come while Jesus is in heaven. But in John 20, Jesus is on earth. He didn't have to leave. He's on earth and he gives them the Spirit. So this cannot be the same Paraclete, the same uh, uh, Spirit mentioned in John 16. Because that Spirit has to come after Jesus leaves, whereas this is happening while Jesus is still on earth. And the same thing in the uh, Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says he casts out demons by the Spirit of God. And in Matthew 10, he gives the disciples the ability to cast out 
spirits, the, the ability to cast out demons, which means the disciples were given the Holy Spirit in the Synoptic Gospels before Jesus ever left. John 16 clearly tells us the paraclete comes after Jesus leaves and he's in heaven. So they did not receive the Holy Spirit in John 16, they received the general Holy Spirit. All right. So there's a general Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, two. Yeah, just yeah, like there are multiple angels minutes. who can call be who can be. No, you got to stop. Yeah, that concludes. Yeah, that concludes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. If y'all don't even mind my earpiece, but yeah, that does conclude the seven minute as far as the seven minute cross examination. So now we're going to go into the five minute. Each uh, debater will get a no, chance. We're going to have bring. another cross actually, uh, Dre. We're going to have a second. Yeah, probably cross. another cross examination. Oh, you guys are yeah. right. I'm looking at it now. You guys are absolutely right. I'm sorry about that. I was actually looking at that. Okay, so I'm going to give it right back over to the brother Abraham. As soon as you start, your time will start. Okay, now, um, do you agree with me that uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 7, Jesus foretells the destruction of Jerusalem, correct? No, I do not agree with that. Okay, I he believe says that, that Matthew 22, I'm, I'm answering, I believe that Matthew 22 is a parable about believers responding to the call of Christ, some accepting it and some not, and the ones that don't accept it are thrown into the lake of fire described as weeping and gnashing of teeth. But in verse 7, after describing how God sends servants and the Israelites killed these servants and rejected them. In verse 7, it says, The king was enraged. He sent his army and burned down that city. Don't you believe that's a reference to Titus destroying Jerusalem, burning it in the year 70 CE? Well, this is a reference to, is a sequence of events that's happening leading up to people dying without either accepting Christ or not accepting Christ. Look what it says right here. Because, by, by the way, by reading this, you are... Admitting that Jesus is a king, I, I, which means I the kingdom is about verse seven specifically. Oh, I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading it. You can't tell me how to answer. I'm answering in the time frame. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, right? It says the king, and you're admitting that Jesus is the king, and this is his kingdom. That's why no, he's called the king. Not. I'm not. It says, yes, you are. It says in verse seven. But when the king heard of this, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burn up their cities. This is a parable about punishment about people rejecting Jesus on this earth. That's what this is talking about. Then it says, then said his servants, the wedding is ready, but that which were bidden were not worthy. Who are the servants of the king? Those are the apostles. They are, or they are the servants of Jesus. They are the slaves of Jesus. They went out preaching the gospel and the people who did not accept it, verse 13, then said the king unto his servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. That's hellfire in the New Testament. Every Christian knows this. There shall be weeping and national of teeth. That is not talking minute. about no seven AD. Uh, okay, that's one minute. Okay. Um let me move to a different topic then since we're running out of time. Uh now mm -hmm. okay, um in Isaiah chapter nine, it's true that it says mm -hmm. that the uh quote, you have broken the yoke that burned them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Have I read that correct? Isaiah 9 and what? Isaiah 9 verse 4. Yes, it says, For thou hast broken the yoke of the burden and the staff of the shoulder um, right. of the shoulder and the rod of the oppressor as in the day of Midian. Yeah, okay. And uh, obviously, again, once again, when Jesus was on earth, he did not defeat the Roman Empire, the physical Roman Empire, right? He did not, no. And once again, the Muslims actually did defeat the Romans. And they actually conquered a lot of land, right? From uh, China to France, right? No question. But if you keep reading in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us, the us here are the Israelites. When you say somebody is born unto us, that means they come from your people. Just like Muhammad came from his people. It says, but unto us, a child is born, the Israelites. Unto us, the Israelites, a son is given. Upon the government shall be his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, okay, I, the I've, Prince okay, of Peace. Oh, you already cannot interrupt, interrupt me. You cannot interrupt me, bro. You're breaking the rules. I don't interrupt you when you answer. Verse 7. Give me a little bit more time for the interruption, please. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David. And upon his kingdom to order to establish it. 
Israelites sit on the throne of David, Israelite kings, not Islamic kings, not an Islamic prophet. This is a prophecy about the Messiah sitting on the throne of David. Okay, so the throne of David thing is a pretty very easy to answer. Um, but since this is a cross, I'm not going to answer it. But uh, we've already agreed that Jesus didn't actually conquer anything of the throne of David, the Palestine. Like, he didn't conquer any of that. And we all agreed that the Muslims actually did conquer all that. Now, I want to look at verse 3. It says, you have multiplied exaltation. You have uh, re increased their joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. So this is talking about the Israelites rejoicing, right? Yes. And so y'all have, yeah. have multiplied the nation, and yes, that's what it's talking yeah. about. Yes. And after Jesus came, the Romans actually slaughtered many of the Jews, right? We have already established ad nauseum that yeah. Jesus did not fulfill these things the first time he was here. At this point, In fact, yeah. just so, just hold on, I'm still, still me. At this point, all you're doing is asking me the same thing over and over again, just in different ways. And I already agree with you that Jesus did not do this stuff the first time he came, but Christians believe. And the Bible teaches he's going to fulfill this stuff when he comes back. Even the Quran teaches the second coming. We also agreed. We also agreed that there were Jews who saw the Muslims as saving them from the Romans and allowing them in the land, etc. Right? Yes, there were plenty of Jews. The Jews saw Cyrus in the Old Testament. They saw him as the Messiah and as a savior when he brought them out of captivity. This, this would not be the first time the Jews saw other nations who showed mercy on them as their saviors. But that's well, not Isaiah messianic. Isaiah called Cyrus Messiah, right? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's because God used him to bring the children of Israel out of Babylonian captivity. But that does not mean he is the Messiah. You don't believe that um, not, um Cyrus is the Messiah? That. You don't believe I'm not that. I know. I'm saying. I know. I'm saying. You don't. I know. You don't. So what I'm saying is. They saw that, but that does not fulfill prophecy. You're trying to make prophecy be fulfilled by how a Jew, an average Jew or a rabbi looks at it. No, that's not how it works. But, but none, none of the texts I actually quoted talk about like a branch from David or a son of David. Like, I believe the messianic passages are like in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and maybe Zechariah 6, etc., which talk about a branch from David, a son of David. Um, Isaiah 11 saying the son of, uh, the root from Jesse, I think that's the Messiah, but I don't interpret it as uh, Davidic lineage. But anyway, I'm not the text I quote, like Daniel never says son of David. Uh, the closest you get is Isaiah 9, which says the throne of David, but that can just be translated as he brings peace to the throne of David, as the NRSV and Joseph Blankensop translate it. And Again, the Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad conquered all of David's kingdom, the north and the south. After a thousand years of pagan rule, he finally united it under God's law and, and rule, and Jesus didn't do that. And I'm out of time. Okay. Um, right, that concludes yep. okay. yeah, that. Yeah, you didn't ask a question. You would have ain't had a chance to answer, but you ain't asked a question there. Uh, so, yeah, that concludes the seven minute cross examination of the brother Abraham. Josh, when you start, your seven minutes will begin. Okay, going back to John 14, because you said that there's a two different Holy Spirits, one that was there with them and one that will come later after them. In John 14 and 17, Jesus says to his apostles, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, which you say is Muhammad, because it see of him not, neither know of him. But ye know him, present tense, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Question. Is Jesus not making the Holy Spirit that was present with them and the one that would come later one spirit? Um, so, yes, he's saying that the spirit that dwells in them is, is going to be in them later, but I would say that is not the same spirit. I would reject your identification of this spirit with the spirit given to them in John 20, because again, Jesus says that the paraclete will come when I'm in heaven, because he says, I have to go for the paraclete to come. While in John 20, he was on earth and he gave them the spirit. And in the synoptic gospels, Jesus gave them the power to cast out demons. And he tells us he casts out demons by the spirit of God. So they already had the spirit of God with them. So it cannot be a reference to the paraclete in John 16, because again, the paraclete comes after Jesus leaves. That's not the question, though. I think you kind of, you kind of misunderstood the question. What you said okay. earlier, was that there are two Holy Spirits, one that was there while they were there, and one that would come later. The question is, when Jesus says in John 14 and 17, even the spirit of truth, singular, whom the world cannot receive, 
because they see of him not, neither know of him, but ye know him. That's present tense. This is one spirit that they know. Then it says, ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So again, is not Jesus saying that this spirit that they already knew would be the same one they would get later? Yes or no? Yeah, he's saying that, but again, the spirit that they know is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who, and they know him in the sense that Jesus had explained who he was to them. Now, you're trying to say because he says the spirit, so that means there's only one spirit. That's wrong. The Bible, in the Bible, there are many spirits. Uh, for example, you read Ezekiel, you have spirits. If you read, there, there's one text, I think, in the book of Kings, it talks about uh, a spirit, uh, like an evil spirit with God. It goes and confuses one of the people. And then one of the texts says, a holy spirit departed and a good spirit came. So there are multiple spirits in the Bible. And I'm saying, John 16 cannot be the holy spirit because Jesus says he has to leave for him to come. Now, you have to explain that. Jesus said, it's good for you that I go away because unless I go... The spirit cannot come. But you admitted in John 20, Jesus was on earth and he gave them the spirit. So what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to make Jesus not be wrong and make a false prophecy and contradict himself. So I'm saying because he said the spirit has to come after he leaves, that's why this can't be the same spirit. And you're trying to make it the same spirit. So how do you explain the contradiction? That's the problem. That's why I think it's, uh, that's why I th I'm saying these are different spirits. That's not what I said. What I said is he breathed on them and told them to receive. Say they received it then. I said he told them to receive it. But here's my question. Oh, he breathed right? it to them. So he came there. No, no. Yeah, he said and receive it. But they didn't get it. The, the, the narrative tells you they did not get it into Acts chapter 1. In fact, in Acts chapter oh, 1, Acts he told them to wait for it. With a different agenda. No, I'm saying, but that's what he said. But here's my question. Can you show me one time in the Bible, just once, where the Holy Spirit, like it says, the Holy Spirit is ever written in the plural? One time. Yeah, so the use of a definite article, uh, it doesn't mean that it has... I need a yes or no it, first. I need a yes or no first. I need a yes or no first. Um, the Holy Spirits, not that I recall anywhere it says the Holy Spirits, but again, the definite article, it does not have to be used with the sense of, oh, there's one specific one. It can be used in the sense of, oh, that particular one. So in this context, he's talking about the particular spirit, Holy Spirit that they didn't have yet. Uh, in the sense that he didn't come yet, he was going to come in the future. So that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the one who's going to come in the future. Then question number two, then how come every time somebody is possessed with the Holy Spirit, get the Holy Spirit, it always is in the singular, even though it's affecting multiple people? Why is it never in the plural? Ever. That's my question. Why is it never in the future? I mean, in the, um, in the plural. I don't, I don't understand. Let me rephrase the question then. Okay. I'm telling you that every time the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit, it's always separate as it's separate from the other spirits that you read about, like demons and try the spirit by the spirit. It's always separate from that. I'm asking you. First, I ask you, uh, can you show any plural? You keep saying it could mean this, it could mean that. But I'm asking you. First, I ask you, can you show me one time where the Holy Spirit is ever in the plural? Because what you're doing is you're making... The Holy Spirit means a Holy Spirit, right. meaning it's one among many. Was there time or two minutes? Uh, yeah, two minutes. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. So what I'm asking you is, why is it that every time the Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit, it always speaks of it in the singular and never in the plural? So again... My whole evidence that the Holy Spirit can be a reference to two different Holy Spirits is literally from the fact that if you think it's the same Spirit, you get a contradiction in Jesus' words. In John 1, 4, 1, it says that it uses the term Spirit synonymously with prophets. It says, don't believe any Spirit that goes out into the world, but test the prophets. So we see that there are multiple Spirits. Now, just because you add the adjective holy doesn't mean it has to be one particular Holy Spirit. Because again, we know in the first century, Jews could call a human being Holy Spirit. Because in the Assumption of Moses, which is a first century text the New Testament alludes to, it calls Moses Holy Spirit. So once again, it can't. Uh, uh, if you can explain this contradiction, go ahead. But Jesus says, it is for your good that I go away. Unless I go, the paraclete won't come. But if I go, then I'll send him. But in John 20, Jesus says, breathe. He breathes and he says, receive. So they get the Holy Spirit while Jesus is still on earth. But John 16 says he can't come until Jesus leaves. So this is the problem for you. Where does it say 
in the narrative that Gabriel is the Holy Spirit. It can totally be interpreted that way based on the first century historical context, which is that spirit can be understood as an angel because many times spirit means angel. The question was where in the narrative? That means yeah, you have to I'm answer saying. from the narrative. Yeah, but that's I mean, from I'm the Bible. That it, it, when it just says, okay, so for example, um, in Ezekiel, it talks about a sp a spirits like taking Ezekiel from the head and, and taking him. I think to the temple and stuff, and that is interpreted as an angel by some. In uh, you know, in the divine assembly, you have spirits, and they go out. Those can be understood as angels, uh, like in the one king's text I showed, where an, uh, a spirit goes out and uh -huh. he makes a king like crazy or whatever. So, in the same way, you can easily interpret spirit here as just an angel, yeah, just uh, like all the other things. Okay, okay. Yeah, finish it. Yeah, yeah. We just let you finish it out. Yeah. Oh, okay, so I was just saying, just like in those texts in the Bible. A spirits can be understood as angels. In this sense, in the Gospel of John, a spirit, the spirit could be understood as an angel like Gabriel. And if you go in this alternative explanation for this paraclete... Yeah, that's it. You can't go no further than that. We just want okay. you to just wrap it up. Just let you finish okay, your thought. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's just let you finish your uh, conclusion. Yeah, just, for of, just for you to be able to close out on that. So that concludes the cross-examinations. I think I got it right this time, everybody. So that was the second round of the cross-examination. Now we're about to get into the conclusion where each debater will give five minutes to pretty much conclude on what they believe they presented and or their opponent didn't present. I believe you said you will go first on this one, Brother Josh? That is correct, sir. All right, once you start your time with. Okay, let me just first by um, thanking um, Ed Bra Rahim for um, stepping up to the challenge like a real G and not making no excuses about stipulations. Say what you want to about them, agree with them, disagree with them. But he saw the challenge and he stepped up. So I got to give him mad props for that. Also, I got to give him another shout out for being um, compassionate about what I was going through. You know, he's just he's just proof that just because you disagree with somebody on a religious level doesn't mean that they're a bad person. Because we kind of have like that concept about each other, like just because we have different religious beliefs that we got to be like at war with each other. I would totally hang out with this dude. <laughs> he seemed like a cool brother. I really would. But with that being said, I would just say that I feel that I proved my point. I stayed on the topic. I kept it in the Bible. I did not try to go to any type of rabbinical commentary. The stipulation of the debate was to prove Muhammad in the Bible. I do not think my opponent did that. I think he had some nice ideas and he has some nice um, concepts about Muhammad. And a lot of stuff sounds very convincing, but convincing sounding is not the same as proof. And he did not prove that Muhammad is in the Bible. Also, the Bible makes it clear that the angel Gabriel is not the Holy Spirit. The angel Gabriel is the one who told Mary that the Holy Spirit would come upon her. They are separate. They're not the same. It's also not a contradiction, as he tried to point out. The Holy Spirit was there. Jesus said the Holy Spirit dwelt with them, but would be in them. The promise of the Holy Spirit was that it would be with them, not that it wasn't there now. The Holy Spirit was present. It tells you in John, in, um, in Luke that John the Baptist was born with the Holy Spirit from the womb. So the Holy Spirit was working through John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit was always there, but that's not the promise that Jesus made. Jesus made the promise that the Holy Spirit would dwell in them, a promise that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 1. The apostles never met Muhammad. Muhammad um, started um, preaching around 613 AD. That's over 500 years later. He promised them that. Did the promise also extend to other later followers? Yes, but you can't overstep the first people, the first generation. If the first generation did not receive the promise, then Jesus lied. So the first generation had to get the first fruits of Christian, the firstborn of the church. They had to experience the comfort of first. If they did not experience the comfort of first, Jesus lied. And my opponent wants you to believe that Jesus did a leapfrog over his closest disciples when it came to the comforter and gave it to later people, even though he promised it specifically to them. Then in Acts chapter one, he told them to wait for the promise on high. He told them to wait for it. He would not tell them to wait for something that they would not experience in their lifetime. And in Acts chapter 2, that's when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Muhammad is not the comforter. The Bible says the comforter is the Holy Spirit. If you believe that Muhammad is the comforter or that Gabriel is the um, comforter, you are saying that the angel Gabriel has sex with Mary. That's what you are saying. And Moses, you said what? 
Two minutes, that's all. Two minutes? Here. Cool, cool, cool. Right? You are saying that Gabriel had sex with Mary. You are saying that Jesus was filled with Gabriel. Jesus had the Holy Spirit too after he was baptized. So none of this stuff makes sense. I proved my point. My reputation is still intact. If we're all honest, y'all know I love my boy Ibrahim, but he got cooked tonight. So I'm going to yield the rest of my time and let him have, you know, have the last word. Thanks again, Ibrahim. Thanks for your understanding. And thanks for you stepping up like a straight up G. That's it. Great. Uh, all right. We have that concludes Brother Josh's uh, five minute conclusion. It'll be on the Brother Ibrahim. When you start your time, we'll start this, sir. All right. So in conclusion, I showed that the kingdom of heaven that Daniel spoke about, that this kingdom had to arise after the Roman Empire. In order, it had to be historically the kingdom that came after the Roman Empire. And historically, there is no doubt the Islamic Empire came after the Roman Empire. So it has to be the kingdom of God. I also showed how Daniel says the kingdom of God will come after Rome divides, which happened in 395 CE. And Daniel says the kingdom of God has to arise while Rome still exists. The Muslims destroyed Rome in 1453 CE. So we have a timeline given by Daniel after 395 CE when Rome is divided, but before 1453 CE when Rome is destroyed. Jesus, his first coming is before this period. His second coming is after this period. He can't come back and destroy the Roman Empire because the Muslims already destroyed it. And Joshua admitted to that. I've also shown how the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him fulfilled Isaiah 9 because he ended the Roman oppression on Palestine, he made the Israelites rejoice, and he had a simple authority upon his shoulder. Jesus, he didn't bring a kingdom, he didn't bring a kingdom of God, Joshua agreed to that. Jesus didn't free Palestine from its Roman oppressors, Joshua agreed to that. Isaiah 42 talks about a servant bringing monotheism to the Gentiles, and the Prophet Muhammad did that. It says he's going to convert the Arabs, the Prophet Muhammad did that. He sa it says he's going to destroy the idols, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did all that. Jesus didn't do that. Uh, as we know, it's Trinitarian, this false, idolatrous Trinitarian Christianity would spread to the Gentiles. In Isaiah 29 and 35, we're told that when Isaiah 42 is fulfilled, there will be a good, a book from God sent, a book from God. And the Quran was sent from God to the Prophet Muhammad. We're told in these texts that a desert will rejoice, and the desert of Arabia rejoiced when the Prophet Muhammad came. We're told that Israelites will be allowed back into Jerusalem, and the Muslims brought Israelites back into Jerusalem. I read you sources saying that Jews came from the four corners of the earth back to Jerusalem. Uh, I also showed how in Isaiah 42, the Quran is call, called God's law. And Isaiah 28 talks about this revelation from God that will come, that will come in a foreign language. The Quran came in Arabic. It will come little by little. The Quran was revealed slowly over 23 years and it will have the letters of the alphabet. And the Quran often begins with letters of the alphabet instead of words. Now, Gideon, uh, sorry, Joshua tried to say that this is referring to the Israelites being scattered all over the world and they have to learn new languages when they're scattered because, you know, they can't speak Hebrew because they're in different lands now. No, Isaiah 28 says, the Lord will speak to them. The word of God will become to them like this. So this is speaking about a wor words from God, revelation from God, not them learning some languages. They also demonstrated that Matthew 22 was fulfilled by the Muslims. Jesus says, in verse 7, that Jerusalem will be destroyed. Davies and Allison agreed that's talking about Jerusalem being destroyed. And then there will be a mission to the Gentiles. And the Muslims went and they invited the, mess, uh, the Gentiles to paradise after that. I agree, the wedding, the, the, the banquet there is describing paradise and people are sent to hell. But the point of the parable is people on earth are inviting the population to uh, uh, accept God and to believe in him. And as a result, people will be gathered in front of God for judgment and some will go to paradise, some will go to hell. Yeah, so the Muslims came after the destruction of the temple and brought a mission to the Gentiles. It cannot be a reference to Paul because, once again, Paul began his mission to the Gentiles before 70 CE, before the temple was destroyed. Matthew 21 also says the kingdom of God will be taken away from the Jews and given to another nation that shall bear its fruits. And guess what it says will happen before that? The Israelites will be punished by God. So again, the mission to the Gentiles happens after the punishment of 70 CE.
He also compared the strong evidence is I brought with weak attempts from the New Testament, which makes up prophecies, which chops off verses and says these are about Jesus. And we showed how Jesus is the exact opposite of so many of these prophecies. Jesus did not bring Israelites back to Jerusalem. The opposite happened. The Israelites were kicked out of Jerusalem after he came. Jesus did not bring a kingdom. Rather, according to Joshua, Jesus was killed under the Roman general Pontius Pilate. And in fact, he preached submission to the Romans, whereas Daniel and Isaiah say that, that this person will destroy the Romans, which the Muslims did. Uh, I also want to talk about just a little bit here about a book that my friend, uh, good friend Zakir Hussein will be writing. It actually has written already, and Abu Zakaria and Adnan Rashid have also written this. This book is called Abraham Fulfilled, and it will go into a lot more detail into these sorts of prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad in the Bible, peace be upon him, and it is a must-buy, it is about to come out. And I finally also want to remind everyone how I showed the Prophet Muhammad came at the right time after the coming of Rome, the destruction of the temple, the division of Rome, the rise of Christianity to the Gentiles, etc., etc. So he comes at the right time and all the descriptions match him to a T. And my time is up.